A hundred years before we protected our heads, players looked after their groin. So don't be as stupid as old cricketers. Protect your computer. NordVPN is the protection I use when facing cyber shortfalls or when the rights issue tried to dismiss me. NordVPN will help you get through the straight bat of any GEO blocks so you can watch all the cricket you want. If you need your pitch changed, well, NordVPN can doctor any surface to a new location so your IP address is set up for you to win. Want to buy an associate cricket shirt from a place that won't ship to your country? Select NordVPN. Want to watch a game on a free stream in another hemisphere? Give NordVPN the ball. Or if you just want to watch a clip on social media that the cricket board won't allow, promote NordVPN to pinch it. So if you need a VPN, go Nord. Use nordvpn.com forward slash Kimba to get a huge discount off your Nord VPN plan plus four additional months for free. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. The link is in the show notes. Protect your computer like a cricketer protects their nether region with Nord VPN today. Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode eight of the Overthrows podcast. I am Behram Kazi, who you can find at Def Bang on Twitter. And with me, as always, is Jared Kimber, who you can find absolutely everywhere. Apologies for being late today, guys. I was covering the PSL final, and clearly Jared was getting a haircut. Uh, you guys can see how uh, the hair is I'm, far too short now. I feel like that game went on for about 12 days. Oh my God, it was long, but a really exciting final. And I see that we have a super chat already. So we'll take that first and then get into our itinerary for today. Uh, okay, go. All right. Shubham Patil asks, Luke Wood in Mumbai Indians, how do you rate him in T20s? Love. Um, I've been following him very closely. Of course, I was covering the PSL. I think he's very, very impressive with the new ball. Brings in that left arm angle as well. And considering how Willie has retired from England and Topley is always injured, I feel like he needs to be on that plane to the USA and Caribbean. I think it's a show short thing. He plays the circuit all over the globe. And I'm really happy that he's landed his first, I, I believe it's his first big break in the IPL. And the Mumbai Indians have had a, a few injuries of their own, right? So it makes sense. And I hope he gets to start. Yeah, he's an interesting player. I don't know if he's quite an IPL level player or even an international level player. I, I could see why you're saying that he is. I think he's maybe slightly below that, but this we're about to find out, right? Um, I like there was a game where I can't. Who does he play for? Is it? He is it Mulsa? played for Peshawar Zalmi. Yeah, so he's playing for them in one game where they were like, I don't know, fifty for five or something, chasing two hundred. And just the way he went about it mathematically, and he, I think he ran out of steam towards the end of that, but it wasn't just slogging. There was a lot of clever batting involved there as well. Um, obviously, you know, he, he works on both sides of the ball. A um, bit of a, maybe a late blooming cricketer in some ways. I don't know how old he is, but he's not young, is he? I think he's been around kind of the, the circuit for uh, quite a while now. So, you know, the, the, there's a lot to like about him. Also, he's a double left-hander. I know that might sound weird, but he gives you variability in that he can bat left-handed um, and also he bowls left arm. Like It's not like he's just doing it on one side of the ball. So I think there's a lot there. I, I, I do, I, I, you know, but whether he's quite at that, that level that you need him to be, I'm not sure. It's an interesting one, right? Because there's so many players who either bat left-handed or bowl left-handed, but don't do both. So uh, I like the fact yeah. that you pointed out how he's a double left-hander. I think it's a new phrase I just invented for cricket, which is weird, but a pure left hander, I don't know how to put it, but you know what I mean. I mean, he provides a lot of utility and he's been playing lots of T20 cricket. So, yes. I mean, I like him and, and he's got a face card straight out of the Peaky Blinders. That's what he has, right? <laughs> so he's got that going for him. Anyway, let's jump into all the stuff that we need to discuss today. First, we're going to come to Bangladesh versus Sri Lanka. We spoke of the T20i series in the previous episode of Overthrow, so you guys can go check that one out if you want to you know, hear stuff on the T20 series. We're going to be talking about the ODIs and it was a three-match series. Bangladesh won uh, by a margin of two games to one. Of course, they were playing at home, you know, and they do more often than not win at home. Their captain, Nazmul Hussain Shanto, who uh, Jared is a huge fan of. It could be, I, I couldn't state it enough. It's, it'll always go understated how, how much Jared likes him. And he scored an unbeaten 122 runs in the first ODI to take Bangladesh home uh, by six wickets. And uh, Jared, till the end of 2022, I checked this. Uh, so... Before these last, you know, 14 odd months, uh, mm. Shanto averaged 14 on the dot in ODI cricket. And now he's brought that up to 33. So it's a great career arc, isn't it? Yeah, no, I think, um, <laughs> I mean, 
he, like a lot of Bangladeshi players, he comes in too early. He clearly has the game for international cricket. Whether he's ever going to be successful or not, I don't know. Um, but he clearly has, you know, something available to him um, uh, on that level. And he had probably one of the worst starts of international. I mean, we've just seen Rajat Padadar struggle a little bit. And who else have we had um, of recent times? There was someone else. But, you know, sometimes players come in and they just slump at the wrong time and they get, you know, thrown away. And he was probably lucky that they kept with him as long as they did. And now he's starting to look like that kind of player that, that can, um, uh, that can certainly help. So look, I, I think there's, there's a lot there to like um, uh, with, with him for when it comes to that sort of uh, situation. But yeah, look, he's just, he, I, if you want to know why I like him, it's partly the backstory of how bad he was at the start, but it's also that he just looks really pretty when he bats. Like there's, mm -hmm. there's something quite aesthetically pleasing about him that tickles me and I enjoy watching him. Um, and also, you know, I think there's a lot of people who just wrote him off and it's kind of funny watching, mm -hmm. um, you know, them having to eat their words. And, um, but yeah, it was, it was fantastic. Um, I think I missed that game because it was a one day and I was like, Oh, I can't be bothered. There's, PCL, WPL, like you know, and then there's the um, Afghanistan Island. I've been watching some of those games. I was not going to sit down and watch an ODI, and afterwards I was like, yeah, I've made a mistake there. <laughs> of course you had. And uh, I mean, he's also got the hair for it. If we ever do the hairstyles episode, like uh, on Crick Picks 10 years into the future, maybe Shanto gets in there because he's got that dead straight long hair at times. And I've just enjoyed him, you know, come into his own. He's, of course, captaining the ODI side uh, and maybe even the T20 side, if I'm not wrong. So that's an interesting one right over there. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to see some new generation players coming in with the bat for Bangladesh. He's certainly one of them. We have um, Ankush Raj 16, Arko, Shubham Patil, Swami Nathan Ramesh, Amit M, Sood Sanyam, Sheraton KD, Alan Thomas, and uh, Amar and Harvey Holloway or Halloway in the comments. Thank you so much uh, for waiting, guys, for starters, and for interacting with us. And, uh, you know, another main feature of this series, uh, at least how I view it, viewed it, was uh, Bangladesh tried a fair few openers in this series, and none of whom are Tamim Iqbal, by the way. Uh, no mm. prime ministers or anything are, are, are getting him back into the side now, it seems. Uh, Shomya Shakar, he made uh, a comeback into the 11. Yeah. You mentioned players who look good when they bat. He's certainly one of them. And he scored 68 in the second game, got concussed in the third, <laughs> and then was replaced by Tanzid Hassan, who we saw Bangladesh stick with in the World Cup. He also scored 84 of 81 in that game. So they've got some good options now up top. Liton Das scored two ducks, and he's out of the side. He was axed mid-series. So they're going through quite the transition at the top, aren't they? No, they are, I think. You know, they we did. I did a podcast with Isam maybe a year ago now. I can't remember when when he was on, but you know, we were talking about that. There's a new generation of Bangladeshi players coming through, and they look at the game a little bit differently. They're more naturally aggressive, um, and it's clearly, you know, having an impact. I think on the way they put pressure back on bowlers. You know, before they were kind of the accumulated team, right? Like you knew they'd get somewhere between 230 and 265, right? And um, in a one day, and you hope that the either pitch out their spinners or one of their quicks had a day out, and, and otherwise they weren't really always that handy. Whereas you look at them now and you're like, there's some guys there that can actually do some realistic damage and, and you know, put pressure back on you. And someone like Sumi Osaka probably was a bit like the early Shanto. In fact, he probably had a better start to his career to sh than Shanto and then really, yeah. really dropped off. I still think there's a too big a gap between their domestic cricket and their international cricket. I don't know how you overcome that in a in a short period, you know. But we, we've seen that with other countries as well. That's you know not that's not just a Bangladesh thing. But it does feel like some of these players get thrown in, and I do think they're also obsessed with youth at times. Mm. Rather, you know, I, I who was the player that they picked recently who came back um, in his thirties and he basically hadn't played for ages, but I thought that was a really, really good sign like of them going, no, no, we're going to pick a player who's actually in form and doing well. And I don't think that player was going to go on and have a great career, but they, I think they were thinking, you know, it's a couple of world cups coming up, you know, maybe he will do well. Just, they're just little signs that Bangladesh cricket is, is kind of, you know, getting to that other level. Um, mm -hmm. And there's plenty of talent there. It's probably still not completely, you know, a, a full team, but there's plenty of talent there. And, and I think it's a sign of, 
you know what it's like you know those sort of mad days of pakistan cricket where like a player would come in they do something really good then they disappear for seven years and we yeah. wouldn't hear of them again then they'd come back but it wouldn't make any sense why they'd come back at that time when they'd come back it just feels like there's something a little bit more structurally sound about what bangladesh is doing now compared to bangladesh a couple of years ago which was a little bit maybe more like pakistan where it's like who's the next 16 year old who's going to make 400 runs right like you know i'm not saying don't look for the players with high upside but if you don't look for the players with a high floor as well um mm. you, you end up with a lot of players who have high upside but actually they can't bat yet because they're like really young or they're still developing yeah i mean i remember the 2007 world cup the odi world cup and uh, they had like a very small or, or uh, young average age. It was like, what, 21, 22 was the average age of that side. There were so many teenagers in there. And I like the fact that they've gone back to Shomir Sakar. And also, uh, Tanzid Hassan, what I do know is that his style of play is attacking. We saw that in the World Cup as well. And he showed it over here in this game as well, 84 of 81. So if they stick to, you know, that opening pair, maybe in terms of approach and style of play, that can be a new chapter in Bangladeshi cricket up top. And, yep. uh, you know, Tamim for all his success, had kind of slowed down a lot with the time. I mean, he started off as an aggressive opener. But... Well, I mean, Tamim's one of those guys who probably was more aggressive in red ball cricket at times than he was in white ball. Like, and we've seen that occasionally before, you know, just the way the fields work and everything. Um, some players feel more comfortable. The player I was looking for, Natesh, just, just put it in the comments, was Rooney mm -hmm. Um yeah. just, just little signs like that, that there are there are things moving forward. There are still issues within, you know, Bangladesh cricket, obviously. Like, we, we all understand that. But there is, it, there are just little signs that things, and, and, I'm not going to lie. Sometimes it's just you have more talent, and so even when you make more mistakes as a cricket culture, you're you're kind of in you're kind of in an area where you can get away with them a little bit. Which is, I mean, you could put Australia and Pakistan in that kind of in that kind of thing. Of sometimes it's like, yeah, they're going to make some mistakes, but eventually they're just going to have a bowler who bowls 90 miles an hour, um, or a batter who no one can get out for a period of time, and they're going to win some games. Um, uh, maybe if they structured everything and got all the little pieces in place that's when you hit that sort of you know peak um performing era but but um just you know bangladesh it just feels like having watched them you know over, over a little period of time now that just it just feels like things are falling in place a little bit better than it was yeah and like arco has mentioned in the comments as well they won both those games you know chased it down with plenty of yeah. balls remaining so it is a different approach now and that's uh, the good comment i think different approach is yeah. the most important thing and a lot of that is just wickets as well like cr so much of cricket is what wickets are you on and do the wickets help you and bangladesh wickets were not really set up for high scoring attacking players right they were set yeah. up for the sort of 120 or 150 ball guys and that's what they produced hmm. And that, I feel, has held them back at times. But this seems to be the dawn of a new era. And another thing that happened in the series was that the old and the new kind of came together really well. I know I mentioned how Tamim is not part of the plans anymore and Shakib wasn't available for this, for this series. But Mushfiqur Rahim is still around. He scored, what, 73 not out in the first game and scored more runs as the series went on and then kind of mocked Angelo Matthews towards the end on the timed out thing. This has got to be the most bizarre rivalry I have ever witnessed in all of cricket. The Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nagin Derby or whatever you want to call it. They really go at it against each other and uh, it doesn't seem like a lot of them are friends, Jared. It just seemed a bit childish, didn't it? Like, I'm just, yeah. like, it's kind of, it's kind of like keeping the gag going when the gag's finished, if you know what I mean, of, of like, yeah, we get it. Um, that happened and we were all there. Um, uh, you know, uh, and, we are i understand why it's going on um but it's not a it's not it's certainly not a, a situation where um he's lost it, for words guys he doesn't know how to explain it <laughs> i just i just think it's one of those things where you're dragging it on for no reasons and of course one day sri lanka is going to embarrass them somewhere because you're not going to beat them all the time right and it's like why would you i always wonder what what's the end game here what's the win that they're going to have uh for that sort of stuff so yeah i always i always worry about that sort of stuff um arco said um uh, Silla and Chittagong has slap pitches with even bouncing grass. It, I don't think the problem is actually as much their international and domestic wickets, by the way. Although there are a lot of those international and domestic wickets that don't have that arco. I think it's the wickets in general in the country. So it's very rarely what your international or your domestic wickets are. What did your players grow up on? 
And it was that was always the biggest problem in England. Even when they made county pitches a little bit flatter, it's there's a lot of people who just grow up playing cricket in England when the wickets are, are, are jagging around, and it meant that their batters prod with their pads first um, traditionally, and that you know you had to get around that. Global warming's helped a little bit, but um, you know these sorts of things do. It's the same with um, South African and spin. Right. And, and, you know, I've talked about that before with the, uh, we did a piece on the um, sweeping shot. So it is an issue in Bangladesh that so many of the wickets don't have, it's, it's the pace on, of the ball. So it's not even bounce and grass, right? It is the pace of the ball onto the bat. Does it allow you to swing through the line? And, you know, if, if you want a perfect example of a team, you know, a, a culture change in that, it was New Zealand. Um, you know, that you, you really, you, New Zealand realized that the issue was that the wickets in New Zealand. So, so I'll put it this way. It's the best way of explaining it. No Bangladesh cricketer at the professional level ever needs to play on a Bangladesh style wicket. Right. Mm. And here's the reason why, because like, if they never made any wickets like that, they will occasionally their wickets will still automatically default back to those things. So if at professional level, and I'm talking domestic cricket rather than international cricket here, there were no wickets that, uh, bounced like traditional or, or acted like traditional Bangladeshi wickets, you would they would still be better against those than anyone else. And that's what New Zealand really worked out, which was if you make flatter wickets domestically, it meant that your players naturally to get to 17, 18, 19, to get to professional cricket are already good on green wickets, right? Because you can't not be in New Zealand. But then you need to almost retrain them on what, the kind of wickets that they might be facing internationally. And New Zealand went with flat wickets because at that time, that was the, the rage in cricket. Hilariously now, not as much um, um, as it used to be. Um, yeah. But, you know, that's what they did. And that's essentially, Bangladesh would be able to do that. And I do think that there's a lot of cricket nations in the world that if they thought about these things in a more, I'm trying to think of the best way of putting it, in a more revolutionary way, Right, and when at when at this, they would actually find gains. Anyway, I know it's it's a moot point. The mo more important thing at the moment is that Bangladesh players are showing some of that natural intent. So hopefully, there are ways that that they can do that. But if you want to do it on mass and sort of change the way your players play, that is the best way of doing those sorts of things of of yeah. of just taking making the professional wickets as much as you can. And despite them not doing that, they've produced these talents, right? Like. We talked about Tanzid and Shomosh Sarkar earlier, but you've got Tawhid Ridoy, who we always yeah. love to talk about. He got 96 as well. You got to produce more Tawhid Ridoys, yeah. right? And he developed from that system where he wasn't even like given those sort of environments to nurture, yet he scored an unbeaten 96 in the second ODI, and he's looked like that sort of player who goes hard at it. So that's the cultural evolution that Bangladesh yeah. probably require over here. It's, it's also, some of it is just mental. Like, I've talked about this a lot with India and Australia. I think up until very recently, they were always trying to make all their players be anchors, right? And and there's no, re you know, so someone like Andrew Simons, why would you make him an anchor? He doesn't need to have a batting average of, of 40 in ODI cricket. If he has a batting average of 30 at a strike rate of 150, he's going to terrify teams, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we know he had that within him. We know he had those gears within him. And, and we're seeing that with Indian players again and again, you know, K.R. Raul and Rishabh Pant, stop making them anchors. So sometimes it is the conditions and sometimes it is the mindset of teams. And I think there was a, within Bangladesh cricket, I do believe there was an idea of we need to produce proper batters to get all the way through the innings. And I get that. It, that probably came out of the fact that they hadn't made many runs, right? Like, you know, early part of their, you know, of, of their development, they didn't have a lot of big run scorers, but eventually you need to develop and you need to move and, you know, you need to be, uh, you know, a lot different um, than anyone else. Yeah. And the way their team is setting up now, if they go with those two openers, Tanzi and Shomia, and then you have an anchor in Shanto, you've got the likes of Ridoy to come in later. Mushafikur brings in that experience. Weirdly enough, they've gotten rid of Litton Das because I would have thought that he would just automatically take over the reins from Mushfiqur Rahim. But it seems like Mushfiqur is the guy for them mm -hmm. for now. Uh, but it's interesting. I like where things are headed for them. And they are going to be part of the Champions Trophy. So these games are more important for them as opposed to Sri Lanka. But coming to Sri Lanka. Now, they might have lost the series, but there were some positives for them. Patham Nisanka has got to be the biggest one, I believe. In the last six innings in ODI cricket mm -hmm. that he's you know batted, he scored three hundreds, and one of them was a double hundred. And the strike rates have been impressive too. That's actually the main takeaway over here. What stood out is the pace at which he's 
scored those hundreds. He got one in this series as well. So that's got to be very, very promising for them going into the future. Yeah, I think me and Estelle did a podcast coming into the World Cup because I think a lot of people had them as a bit of a sleeper team. And me and Estelle were like, really? And, and I think our theory was that, yeah, their bowling could could do some damage. I think there's... Um, I think there's no doubt before uh, that their bowling can do something and that they're quite handy from that perspective. Um, uh, but the other the other side of it is that, you know, that they're batting, even when it made runs, it made runs slowly. And so they couldn't put a lot of pressure back on unless, so their bowlers had to be absolutely brilliant. And we certainly saw some games where they were. And then unfortunately got injured a lot and then they got out of form and all sorts of things. This makes more sense. And you, you and I have talked about this with Pakistan as well. Yeah. If you if you make your bowlers win limited overs games again and again, you kind of need the greatest bowling attack of all time, right? Or a lot of luck. If you can put pressure on both sides of the ball, and we saw at times in that World Cup where Sri Lanka was actually scoring at a fast rate, that that's what their players need to be able to do. And I think some of this is a natural freedom that probably England have brought from less so basketball, but the white ball revolution, although I think basketball plays a part of it as well. And some of this is probably just natural evolution of T20 cricket as well, where players are just so used to scoring slightly quicker, you know, they're more comfortable in doing so. So I do think there's a few different um, changes uh, within that. But, you know, we're, this is different than what we're talking about with Bangladesh. What we're talking about with Bangladesh really is newer guys turning up uh and being uh and being slightly more aggressive than we have seen players of, of previous generations with Sri Lanka we're talking about guys who were anchors kind of changing who they are a little bit yeah. and you know we saw it with Kusal Mendes and now we're seeing it with Nasanka um and I, I find that really really interesting and you know whether it's just the freedom Chris Silverwood is you know giving them or you know what the situation is I don't know but they look I'm not willing to say that they're like a huge chance of winning any World Cups coming up, but they just look like a naturally more competitive team playing in that kind of style. Yeah, I mean, I would say that ever since, you know, Sangakara and Jaiwardhane, they hung their boots and post T20 World Cup when this is the first time I'm feeling like Sri Lanka is kind of rejuvenating into a competitive side in white ball cricket because red ball at home, they always kind of turn up, uh, especially versus Senna nations. You mentioned Kusal Mendes, of course, he started doing this before Nisanka. He yeah. also carried his good form from the T20 score to 50 over here. You've got Charita Salanka who's been doing so well for so long, right? Like he's been mm -hmm. a proper mainstay in the middle order now, scored uh, 91 in the game that Sri Lanka won as well, that, that one solitary ODI. But neither were as impressive as Janet Lianage the lower middle order batter, who now in six ODI innings, Jared, has scored 350s and 100. He scored a total of 346 runs at an average of nearly 70. And he was the leading run scorer in this ODI series as well. An unbeaten 101 in the last game and also 67 in the first. And he bats at number six. So he's turning out to be a great fix for Sri Lanka after they've got all those uh, you know, guys who've been playing for a bit, the Mendeses, the Samra Wickramas and uh, Asalankas. Then you got this guy at six and that gives them, you know, more breathing space and they can play more freely just because they know this guy can score runs at six. Yeah, I mean, he's probably not going to stay at six if he keeps playing the way he is, if, <laughs> if we're being honest. Um, have, have you seen him bowl? I didn't see him bowl um, at all. There's, I don't think he's a bowl, but my memory of him from my old database is that he could bowl a little bit as well. Um and not, not anything great or anything, but, you know, Do that's... need him, though? Because Asalanka can roll over his arm. No, no, no. I just meant... I, I, my memory was of him traditionally was was he was more of an all-rounder. Um, and so, you know, he's come in. Yeah, he's an odd player for number six in some ways. Um, I don't know where they fit him in, it, you know, but as you said, maybe they just, that's what they do. They've got a little bit of bowling up the order, and so they just think to themselves, um, you know, let's... Um, uh, let's uh, change that up a little bit and go with someone. I, I think that to get back to the Andrew Simons thing from before, I've, there are teams who think having a number six who is a frontline batter allows you to play a little bit harder. I suppose that we've seen um, South Africa. They're, uh, they're probably the best yeah. example of this, right? Of just being like, we're just going to back our top six to make a lot of runs. Um, and, and, you know, we see other teams who have a weaker number six who has some bowling skills or is, is a wicket keeper or whatever. Based on this, he looks like a very good number six. I, I kind of want to see him in other positions. He's, I was just looking up his record just now. Where is it? Um, he's, uh, you know, he's what, 28, 29, um, list eight cricket, averages 45 with strike rate of 84. 
you know, those are pretty solid numbers, but not not an exceptional first class record or anything. So it's it's an it's an interesting uh he's an interesting player to keep an eye on. Um but as you said, in this particular series, the ability f- that allows for them to go a little bit harder at the top, knowing that you have some I mean, that was always the thing with yeah, with Rassi van der Dussen when he was averaging 70 or whatever it was, and and David Miller never going out. The South Africans just knew that they could go a little bit harder, at, you know, in in that sort of middle period if they had to, um, and one of them would back them up every time. That's a huge advantage to have. Absolutely, and you know they don't have to play any major ODI tournament till twenty twenty seven, so they have that luxury of time. I know it kind of sucks that they're not going to be in the Champions Trophy, but still, they can kind of develop a team yep. for you know twenty twenty seven, and that gives them time. You've got Hasaranga at seven, and if they play Wellalage at eight, that's a deeper batting lineup as well. Um, Hasaranga actually had an interesting series, right? Uh, came back from his ban, played a T twenty I, I believe, and then uh, took like uh, four wickets in the game that they won. In the first game, he went for runs and didn't take a wicket. And in the last game, he took two wickets. But do you remember we spoke about a guy in the last podcast who I said had a terrible record and pretty much had his best game ever in one yes. of the T20s where he scored 50 off 30 and took two wickets? Well, that guy scored 40 off 11 off Hasaranga and ended up with an unbeaten 48 of 18. His name is Rishad Hossein. And that's his best list day score. Former best was 12. So that's a uh, he's, he's quadrupled that. And in, in no amount of deliveries as well, like 18 deliveries is nothing. Mm. And, you know, he's 21. They've kind of uh, shoved him in there out of nowhere. Maybe there is something to this kid. Maybe I'm wrong and they know something I don't. <laughs> uh, I mean, let's let's hope so. Look, it, it's um, he's worth watching, isn't he? Because, you know, how many times we see a play like this and then they sort of disappear or, or you know, um, remember that Muhammad Harris, um, mm. uh, I, uh, what was it last? T20 World Cup and everyone was really yeah. excited. And then you looked at his stats and you went, "He's, yeah, he's done very, very well against like one or two types of bowling. This is going to be slightly tougher and slightly more varied for him. Sometimes those things j- just happen. And other times, you know, um, I suppose Tom Hartley and Shoal Bashir, um, Matt Kuhneman, you know, we've seen players be picked uh, based on, on talent before. And I, I don't ever think you shouldn't pick players for talent, but you should know why you are picking them and that they might need extra treatment if things go horribly wrong for them or if they get dropped. Because I think that's one of the worst things when you pick a young kid who hasn't done much professionally before. Mm. They do really, really well. It's actually the dropping that is sometimes the biggest problem, right? You know, uh, you know, those sorts of things happen um, and the emotional state of, of how those sort of things go. But hey, man's, you know, living the, living the life at the moment. Good on him. Yeah, what, two sixes and three fours uh, in one single over versus Hasaranga completely obliterated him. So joke's clearly on me, guys. And this guy, if he goes on to become the best leg spin bowling all-rounder since, I don't know, Rashid Khan or whatever, if you want to call Rashid Khan an all-rounder, then then we can have a lot of fun with this uh, in years. Aubrey o- Faulkner, Faulkner is the greatest uh, leg spinning yeah. all-rounder, and you should know yeah, that. Um, I just what before, too, I, um, I was talking about uh, Luke. Would, but I, I think I was talking about Luke Proctor as well because there's two Lukes and <laughs> they're both like late blooming English um, talent. So I think I was talking about too much of Luke Wood's batting. Although I did see him make runs, I think at least a couple of times in this, um, which he hasn't done uh, before. But again, he scored some crucial sixes at times, but that was pretty much that. But 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 there was a I can't remember which game I was watching when he when he when he did that, but he he showed me that he, there was something there. And I don't really mean as a batting option. What I meant was he was thinking his way through a position in a game. And you that's the sort of thing that you want for that sort of slightly higher level player, right? Because he's going to be in positions where he's going to have to go up against, you know, Virat Kohli and, you know, whoever, you know, all these different players. You want the thinking to be there. And that's why I was, um, but but I did, there's too many Lukes. There's too many Ollies. There's too many Lukes. I don't really understand. There's too many Mitches. Um, too many Mitches. Muhammad's I mean there was I think then we need to you know maybe we need to go back to numbers for people's names um make There's, it a little uh, bit easier two Shamars now as well you've got Shamar Brooks and Shamar Joseph so uh excuse us whenever we make these mistakes both of us have this issue and uh, Arko has said over here that they've taken a punt on Rashad basically because he has exceptional slogging ability well no shit Hasaranga is one of the top, top, top players in the world right now. If he took him to the cleaners, then I'm sure there's something over there. But also, yeah, that- like as a leg spin, just before we go off him, just as a leg spinner in, in general, like, you know, you, you have to, you have to find leg spinners in Bangladesh. And so if you have one who can bat, 
it probably helps you play them at home and then yeah. they're more, going to be more useful when you when, when you travel away from home so that's kind of what they might need as a leg spinning prospect because we know that the, the wickets just don't soon leg spin as much as um some of the other parts of asia do yeah and having both him if he obviously comes off and Mehdi gives them more batting depth as well so there's lots of good stuff over there happening anyway that wraps up our uh, discussion on Bangladesh versus Sri Lanka. We're going to take a short break and stay with us because we'll be talking about Afghanistan and Ireland on overthrows after the short break. So yeah, see you after the set. If you need your pitch changed, well, NordVPN can doctor any surface to a new location so that your IP address is set for you to win. Want to watch a game on a free stream in another hemisphere? Give NordVPN the ball. Or if you just want to watch a clip on social media that a cricket board won't allow, promote NordVPN to pinch hit. So if you need a VPN, go Nord. Use nordvpn.com forward slash Kimba to get a two-year contract with a discount plus four extra months and gifts in some markets. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. The link is in the show notes. Protect your computer like a bowler protects the boundaries in the death overs with nordvpn.com forward slash Kimba today. Welcome back to Overthrows. You're with Behram and Jared. And before I actually get into the next topic, I see that a lot of you guys have questions regarding the PSL. It's not part of our itinerary today for this show. Maybe we'll do a red inker on it. I don't know. I have to discuss that with Jared still. Yeah. And uh, yeah, because there are some takeaways that I have after covering the tournament. But you guys can send us super chats and I'd love to answer those questions. Right now, we're going to move on to Afghanistan versus Ireland. We had an ODI series. Oh, just before you go ahead, there's a bunch of comments about um, us talking about Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. We're talking about it because it's the major international cricket this week. And mm -hmm. we talk about um, international cricket. If you don't like us talking about international cricket, go and find another podcast that just talks about your favorite team over and over again. This is a podcast that talks about the things in cricket um, that are going on in the global game. Right. Like we did Afghanistan Island and we'll do all sorts of different things, uh, you know, a, as they come up to us. If you're going to comment about that, you can just disappear. We're, you're no, you, th there's no point watching the show. It's not for you to begin with. We're not going to listen to you <laughs> quite clearly. <laughs> right. But also it's just, this is, this isn't the show for you. I don't know. Go find someone talking about the same talking points over and over again. Maybe India's number four batting position is uh, someone's <laughs> doing a podcast on that right now. I'm sure. <laughs> Chad made a video on that, by the way, on the actual channel. So you can actually go check that out if you really don't enjoy this. There's that. But uh, yeah, I mean, the whole concept is to cover all sorts of global cricket that's happening international. And Afghanistan versus Ireland is actually quite a big series in my eyes because these are the two newest entrants in, you know, who, who got full member test status. And now they're playing this full-on series. And uh, the ODI series, let's talk about that before. One of the ODIs was abandoned and Afghanistan won the other two. The star of the show and player of the series was Rehmanullah Gurbaz, who scored uh, 121 in one of those games and 51 in the second. Afghanistan obviously won both of those games. And he now has 600s and 550s in 40 ODI innings. I think that's a splendid record for someone who actually is a bit of a basher as well. Yeah, it's, it, I, I've, I found that fascinating. Someone sent me that message the other day. I hadn't seen it either. So I, I was with you. I was a bit like, what? Ha has he? Because I was just doing some of the preview for the IPL. And when I was doing the preview for the IPL, I was like, you know, is is he good enough to be able to make runs consistently? And you're like, well, he is in one day cricket now. And and I haven't I haven't you know gone through his detail his details I haven't gone through his record in you know huge um, uh, a huge amount at the moment but but my guess is that like he's uh, he's made some scores against some decent teams in that and Ireland have actually you know um, been been uh, quite good for a while but he's like you know it's not like he's making all those runs against Netherlands like he's made, I'm just having you now he's made a hundred again two hundreds against Bangladesh uh, two against Ireland one against Netherlands and Pakistan that's a quite a healthy Considering the amount of games he's played against all those teams, that's quite healthy. If if they were all against those teams, and it's from no matches, mm. so it, I, I'm with you. I, it doesn't um, it doesn't exactly make um, a lot of sense to me uh, to go down that that, uh, that 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 he's doing that. I should say, but uh, good on him, and he should continue to make runs. Everyone should try and make runs if they can. Yeah, he really kicks on once he gets a start at times. I feel like if he crosses 50, there's a good chance he's going to turn the game. I, I think he performed versus England, was it? In the World Cup, uh, maybe an 80-odd versus England, if I can't 
Uh, yes, I correct, think you're right. right. Yeah, yeah, I think he's. Uh, yeah, actually, I have a look. He's only ever played one game against him. He averages eighty. So you're yeah. bang on. Um, yeah, no. I, I mean, and I remember. I think we did something on the scoreboard at the time, and we talked about it. He, he's an interesting player because kind of looks, as you said before, looks like he should be a T20 dasher, mm. averaging like 27 with a strike rate of 150, um, yeah. and yet somehow has managed to make one day cricket kind of work for him. Um, mm. So uh, you know, it's. Very, very interesting. Obviously, still very early on in his career. Um, I know he's played an absolute ton of T20 games, um, but I don't think he's played that much of cricket outside of that. So not th none of his record kind of makes sense. It's, it looks like someone has cut and pasted two different records from two different players and put them together on, on um, Crick Buzz or Crick Info. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, I mean, I think he complements Ibrahim Zadran really well because he's a proper anchor, right? And he's actually batting at first drop in T20 cricket, which I don't understand, but he's getting runs. He scored 72 in the final T20 international that happened today and scored uh, an anchoring 50 in one of the ODIs as well. But we've talked about Zadran far too many times on this show, so yeah. we're not going to go over that again. I actually want to talk about the ODI captain, Hashmatullah Shahidi, because mm -hmm. I was impressed with what he was able to offer in the ODI World Cup. I thought he was a washed player and he kind of changed that notion in my head over there and in this series he scored two very very contrasting knocks in both of the ODIs that uh, Afghanistan won there was a 33 ball 50 and mm -hmm. then there was 103 ball 69 so yeah I mean that's quite a diverse skill set yeah I mean I, th I think you're right it feels it feels weird because he's like what's the best way of putting it it feels like he's a a player in development but but he's also like the captain, right? Like he's and he's he, got to be old. I've been seeing this guy for a while. <laughs> and know? so it feels like he's suddenly worked out maybe a gear in his game or you know, or something has clicked. Because yeah, if you would have asked me a while back, I don't know if I would have said he was washed. I just would have said he was always a sort of second tier player. Like if you have injuries or um or maybe the sort of guy that you want for your your squad. I think that would have been absolutely fine, but that's a very different to what we're seeing at the moment. And uh, it's there's so many kind of exciting storylines of of some of their players at the moment. You know, when we talk about batting, and and over the last couple of years, it's almost all been bowling, right? Almost mm -hmm. since the beginning, if we're being honest. You know, it's been bowling, and suddenly it's like there's all these different players that have these fascinating, um, um, you know, transformations or numbers or whatever it may be, and. I don't know how much Jonathan Trott has to do with this. I think some of it started before Trotty as well. So, you know, maybe even being there is helping. But it feels like some some skills of these players have been unlocked. Definitely. I mean, maybe they've uh, gained a lot of confidence from that World Cup campaign. It was four wins out of nine. But, you know, if it had not been for Glenn Maxwell, they were a decent shout for the semifinal as well. And Hashmatullah Shahidi was the captain then too. So maybe it's that, you know... Uh, hangover or whatever motivation that they've just carried through in their ODI team. Another, I wouldn't even call him a late bloomer. He's just an overall bloomer at this point. One of Afghanistan's best ever cricketers, Mohammed Nabi. Uh, I remember just on overthrows a couple of weeks back, I think they were playing uh, Bangladesh back then. Uh, oh, sorry. I think they were playing Sri Lanka back then. Uh, Mohammed Nabi scored his highest score in ODI cricket. Was it done? And just now in this ODI series, he's got his first ever Pfeiffer. He returned figures of 5 for 17. Now, in one of the T20s, he scored a 38 ball 59. This man is just, he, he's not, you know, stopping at all. He's just getting better with age. And I really want to know what his diet looks like because he's a fit bloke as well. Do you, he must be in his 40s, right? Mm -hmm. I, th I think he's, he's listed at late 30s, but he must be in his 40s. And to think about, you know, obviously Rashid Khan's an incredible story. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've had, you know, all these different players who, who've made it in international cricket and also playing in, you know, leagues like the PSL and the IPL and the Big Bash. And 100. They're all, there's some, so many great stories. But Muhammad Nabi is kind of the most ridiculous one because you're talking about someone who has like a 20-year career from a country that doesn't didn't have a 20-year career coming in, right? Yeah. So when he started, they basically didn't have any cricket. And yet somehow he managed to make, I, 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 you know, I know the refugee camps and everything played a part, but somehow he managed to make a career from an industry that didn't really exist. And then he's doing it still in his 40s. And, you know, like, who's he playing for? Is it Sun? No. Who did he uh, sign no. for in the IPL? I just did it. I just did that thing. And I remember writing his name. But 
And like he's still in the IPL. He's probably still going to get some playing time, right? And you're like, what? What? And I would say actually, he didn't get enough playing time at times in the IPL as well. Back in Mumbai. The day. He he was with Sunrisers. Yeah, you're right. He's with Mumbai now. And he's probably thanks to Darshan and Sheraton as well. So, yeah, yeah. yeah um, it's just particular. And like of all the teams, he's literally like the Ambani's have bought everything in cricket, and then they bought Muhammad Nabi. Is like <laughs> you know the the greatest story of all time. He's a, he's a phenom, and I, as I said, I think at times he's been he gets undervalued, and it's easy to do. I remember me and Sid Monger were just absolutely obsessed with his bowling because of how shit it looked. And we didn't mean that in a bad way, but just of like, he kind of looked like a slightly better version of Chris Gale, but his numbers are not Chris Gale light numbers, right? Um, and he's batting, he has some like holes in his game, but then when it comes together, like there's nothing you can do against him on certain days. Just a phenomenal cricketer to be able to do it for that long. He's also like really developed his slogging over the years. I feel like he's a reliable hitter at this point. And with the ball, he's gotten better. It's just something that defies biology. How Mohammed Nabi right now of today is a better player than Mohammed Nabi of 10 years ago. This is a guy who was also uh, playing for the MCC at, at one point. I remember uh, through those exchange programs and everything. So it's a fantastic story. Whenever he retires, we're definitely going to pod about him. And, uh, yeah, if he retires. If, if he ever retires. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to see him play in the T20 World Cup because this is the best he's ever been. And it's quite the enigma, right? Uh, speaking of enigmas though, Rashid Khan is back. And he was captain in the T20I series, which they won two games to one. And took three for 19 in his first game, back after surgery and rehab. Took four for 14 in the second and also one for 12 in the third. So went for no runs, took eight wickets in those three games and then scored some of those ridiculous looking shots as well with the bat. Was that in the second the game? Which was the yeah. game he made the run? Yeah, second game, wasn't it? Yeah, so 25 of 12 and that, that six, that weird looking six. <laughs> so second game we got um I was watching it uh, and my son came in and he was watching Rashid Khan bowl and, and and there was a ball he bowled I want to say to Barry McCarthy that mm. pitched on middle stump and beat Barry McCarthy's bat by like a foot and a half and my son's head exploded he couldn't understand how anyone could miss a cricket ball by that much um and it was just, it was a remarkable period. And I think, I re remember looking at that game, I think Ireland got off to a really good start. And I was, I was checking the betting markets to see what they were thinking. And the betting markets were like, yeah, Ireland's a chance here. And I was like, they're not a chance here because Rashid Khan is going to come on to bowl at a certain point and it's going to be game over. And, and, and that's what, I, you know, it's such an important player to be able to have, and especially in T20 cricket, his ability to run through middle orders especially i love the way that afghanistan use him in that kind of uh enforcer role right like it like he's a fast bowler um uh from the 50s or something of just like yeah yeah we'll wait until and we'll, we're not going to use him against the openers there's no point but the minute there's a weakness here we're just going to bring him on um no absolutely I, I love that and and as you said coming back from rehab looked fantastic was spinning the ball a long way on those surfaces uh and whacked him as well like it, it didn't look like didn't look like he was easy himself back in. I'll put it that way. Yeah. I mean, I would say that if someone was to create a T20 team from scratch with an unlimited purse, Rashid Khan would be the first player that they would pick. For a lot it, of those people, that would be the case. It takes a team, as special as the Sunrisers, to let him go. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, a lot of those players that the Sunrisers let go off and now have acquired and can't play in tandem. We'll get to all of that fun stuff someday. The IPL is just upon us. But uh, yeah, I mean, happy that Rashid is back and at his best. And he's an absolute cheat code in the format. Like T20 mm. cricket is something he absolutely owns. But it's not just the spinners, right? In the last T20, uh, you know, Afghanistan's pace battery kind of, uh, they were essential towards uh, bowling Ireland out for 98. That game happened today. Uh, yeah, I know Fazal Haq, Fazal Haq hasn't gotten wickets in the T20Is, but he got a four for in one of the ODI games. And I like what I see from him. Also, the left arm angle is something that that definitely helps them. But Naveen is back. He got three for 10. And then Azmatullah, this guy just, I mean, he's also someone whose trajectory is just going up and up and up. Sometimes he'll score quick runs with the bat and big runs with the bat. And today he took four for nine. So if you've got an attack of Naveen, Fazil Haq, Azmatullah, Rashid, Nabi, Mujib, that is pretty damn good. Yeah, it's, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's got kind of everything that you need, right? Defensive spinner, 
a part-time spinner who, who can uh, bowl for matchups, you know, a, a wrist spinner who is also, a, 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 you know, attack, new ball bowlers who can also bowl Yorkers at the death and an all-rounder who can kind of pinch it in a couple of different roles. It's, you know, we've talked about him a lot and obviously he's going to be in the IPL as well. Um, so it'd be fascinating to see how he goes there. Um, you know, we see a lot of those sort of West Indian all-rounders play in, you know, get picked up for big money in, in, in the IPL and they really struggle with the spin when they get to that level. Right. I do wonder if that is um, something that's slightly easier for an Afghanistani or uh, all rounder um, to be able to do from that point of view. But yeah, you're right. It's, it's a really good six person attack. Um, how their bat, I mean, from a world cup point of view, cause that's kind of what we're looking at. Yeah. Right. How does that go? I still think, I mean, I didn't think they were going to do as well as they did in the one day world cup. So who knows what they'll do in the T20 world cup. I still think their batting is maybe, a little bit thinner than what they need, but you're right. You know, they've got two, and if you throw Rashid Khan's hitting in there, they've kind of got three guys who can bowl and hit and bat a bit. Um, that's a great flexibility to have in, in any team. And, you know, it's kind of overkill for Ireland at the moment because, yeah. you know, once, once it gets to the middle, Ireland just get themselves stuck um, in a lot of those games. Um, uh, but it's, you know, you know, fantastic for Afghanistan. It'd be really interesting to see how they go from there. I mean, if you look at the depth over there, right? Mohammed Nabi is probably better with the bat as opposed to him with the ball, even if the numbers re in recent times suggest otherwise because he's been terrific, terrific with the ball as well. But Mujib has started to hit. You know, uh, there was this ODI against Pakistan, I believe, in which he hit the fastest ever ODI 50 for an Afghan batter. Uh, and, you know, he's no mug. Rashid, we know, can do things with the bat. Azmat also has impressed big time with the bat. Mm. So the only people who can't bat in all of these guys that I just named, uh, maybe Naveen and Fazalak Farooqi. So you've mm. got, you're batting up until nine, which is a great luxury to have, especially in yeah. the 20s. I mean, I think you're pushing out a little bit with Majib. I know he has made runs. He's certainly improved. Yeah. He's not what he was. I remember, I reckon I was at a game, which was maybe the first time he ever made it to double figures or something. It was something ridiculous like that. He's batting at number 11. And I think he broke the record for a big bash player um, batting at number 11. Um, but yes, it, you know, but even so, he's certainly a lot better than he used to be. So yeah, they're, they're, that flexibility, the ability to have players who can play, uh, who can give you something on the other side of the ball without take, you know, um, you're not, you're not all those players are great in their second skill, right? Mm. But they have something to offer in their second skill. And more often than not, they're pretty good with their first skill or great with their first skill. So there's a lot that, that, that allows you flexibility of tactics allows your flexibility of selection um it can cover injuries at times all those sorts of things so i think it's a it's a really important one yeah i think the third skill is what would be an issue for them because we've seen afghanistan drop a lot of Mujib catches. cannot feel yeah. correct yeah yeah he cannot <laughs> feel it all and it's interesting how i've noticed alex hales can also not feel it all uh dropped so many catches this psl but maybe that's a conversation for another time we've spoken enough about afghanistan <laughs> just <laughs> unnecessary drive by of alex house but he can't feel it. you're right yeah <laughs> anyway uh ireland of course only were able to win one of those games out of the five completed fixtures on this limited overs tour uh and i mean of course they were in alien conditions but they won a test match over here so it's not like they're not mm -hmm. remember this tour and harry tector was probably the star of the show for them scored 138 in an odi and then scored 56 of 34 in the t20 international that they actually won so he's been the most promising batter i believe for them coming through the ranks and he just keeps on adding more runs to kind of solidify that notion it's him and lock and tucker right yeah i think lock and tucker i've talked about it a lot I'm Luke obsessed with Lorcan Tucker, but I think Lorcan Tucker probably su surprised everyone with how quickly he developed. Mm -hmm. Harry Tector was the one they were expecting to be the, you know, their mainstay of their batting, um, sort of tall, elegant, not the sort of batter that, with all due respect to many of my friends who are Irish batters, but not that, you know, he's not Ed Joyce or, you know, or Owen Morgan or Gary Wilson or, you know, Niall O'Brien. Those are the sort of batters that they've, they've kind of produced. And, you know, William Porterfield and then, you know, a lot, uh, uh, Harry Tech is more like a Rassi van der Dussen type of batter, you know, slightly more mechanical at times, um, you know, long levers, um, you know. So so from that perspective, I think, uh, uh, you know, he's a little bit different and he, he takes the eye. But Lorcan kind of 
jumped him just because of how brilliant Lorcan was over that, whatever it was, 12 or 18 months there. Uh, but Harry Tector is the one that they kind of think that their batting will be built around in the future. Yeah. You know, that Andy Balboni was supposed to be the other one. And unfortunately for them, Andy Balboni just took too long to develop and he's become a very good player. But, you know, sadly, quite late in his career, whereas, you know, um, with Harry, you know, with Harry and Lorcan, those are younger players coming through showing this. But they're still very, very dependent, I think, on that sort of Sterling Balboni opening. But, you know, uh, you've got you've got Tucker and... Um, uh and and tech uh but then you've also got camphor and mm. um dockerel and i'm missing someone delaney, Is it yeah. delaney? yeah gareth delaney behind them that's still like that's more what's the kindest way of putting this because i know that one of the irish lads will watch this that's kind of a an High energy batting is the way I would put those guys. Do you know what I mean? That they try all those guys try really, really hard, right? But that's why you need your your you know your top your your top guys to make a lot of runs because you, you know they're gonna. It's 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 a you want Camphor to come in when you're in a decent position and he can cause some chaos, right? You want Delaney to come in when you just need his hitting and you want Dockerel to come in for, you know, in, in a similar sort of situation. You don't want them to be coming in um, with lower scores because, you know, to go back to your point before about Sri Lanka having a n number six who, you know, is just, you know, always scored runs at list A level. George Dockerel was a frigging bowler, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, you know, it's a completely different situation um, to be in. So, yeah, I think it's a really, really fascinating um uh, situation so it puts a lot of pressure on Lorcan and, and Harry who are still developing as cricketers right like th they're not the finished product and they didn't have the big advantage that those other Irish batters have they don't have six and seven and eight years of county cricket right yeah. of playing game after game after game and then occasionally going on tour with Ireland it's a lot harder to develop those kinds of, of players but I think the Harry Tector is a genuine international quality batter um, whether he's going to be a star or not I don't know but I think there's a lot to like there I feel like at times maybe Ireland would do better if they kind of promote him in T20s. Maybe send him out to open. Because Sterlo, sure, he'll hit you that odd 50 here and there. But he's in the twilight of his career. And if I send Paul Sterling at any phase of a T20 game, if he comes off, he comes off, I, I feel. So maybe. So give... Sterling bats lower in the test team, doesn't he? Does he bat mm. five or something in the yes, test team? he does. It, it's an interesting one. I mean... Uh, I mean, look, we talk, I've done a whole video about how Andy McBride was used as a pinch blocker, right? They know they're a batter and a half short. Like, with all due respect to George Docker, what a frigging turnaround of a career that has been. Like, he should be so proud of himself to be on the, from a bowler who people thought would bowl for England to a guy who was on the scrap heap who couldn't bowl anymore, all the way back to a batter for his country. Incredible career. But if you're relying on guys like George Shockrell to do that, it does tell you that you're missing a couple of batters there, right? Um, yeah. So maybe they don't want to get too co uh, I was going to say coy. Coy is the wrong word. Too too funky to mm. um, uh, with it. But but I see your point as well. Yeah, I mean both of those guys got runs, right? So Tector and Tucker, they'll definitely be carrying. It's Ireland so annoying their... that they Tector and Tucker. Are you, is that not <laughs> annoying to you? We just talked about all the Lukes and the Ollies and the Muhammads and the Mitches. Tector, I I hate it. I hate it so much. And they're not even that similar those names, yeah. but there's something about it. And and as I have said before, Lork and Tucker, just a brilliant name. Um, if you're writing a young adult um uh, book about some you know um some science fiction book about a you know a teenage girl it, she's at one stage going to have a run in with the Lorcan Tucker like he's going to be the <laughs> secondary um uh, I, maybe I've read too many science fiction books in um when I was a teenager but I'm pretty sure Lorcan Tucker was a character in at least one of them yeah well Lorcan Tucker actually bagged a PSL deal this time as well he played a couple of games for Lahore but Shaheen of course promoted himself ahead of Lorcan Tucker uh, but <laughs> Good on good on Lorcan for scoring 85 in one of those games. And obviously, Shaheen was going to come and bat ahead of him, right? Because we know what sort of captain he is. Um, you spoke about, oh, well, you mentioned George Dockrill and how once we thought that this guy is going to be Ireland's main spinner for the next decade, that didn't quite pan out. But there was a leg spinner in their ranks this time who won them a T20 international versus Afghanistan in conditions that favored Afghanistan. And his name is Ben White, got four for 20. And uh, I haven't seen much of him, so I'll let you do the talking on this one. Yeah, I'm trying to remember when Ben White first came on my radar, but I think someone sent me a message about him a while back. Um, 
you know, he's uh, he, he's he's come through the system. I I, I want to say this correctly, just so the Irish fans don't have a go. But I I think he is. Um, he played junior cricket all the way through in Ireland, um, and I know uh, you know. So I don't know. This is the best way of putting it. I don't know what it's like to be a young wrist spinner in Ireland because we haven't seen many, right? Like it's it's not something that we have a good um, uh, history of, right? So he's also know, the- never going to be the most famous Ben White because I believe Arsenal, the football club, their centre back is Ben White. So there's yeah. that. Well, I think the interesting thing with Ben White for me is, but you are right, there is there is a footballer called Ben White. But the interesting thing for me is that he's played a little bit in Test cricket now and uh, not 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 been successful so far. I think probably in the short term, I'd be trying to play him a little bit more in limited overs cricket um, and, and see how he goes uh, how he goes on on that kind of level. But what what I what I am interested in is the fact that him and Gareth Delaney are quite often playing in the same side, and so. The reason that Ben White exists outside of Test cricket is because Gareth Delaney's bowling hasn't quite—I I don't know—I don't know, even know how much he's bowling anymore. But his bowling hasn't quite ha- um, stayed up uh, with where it needs to be, right? Like you know, that—that that was the, part of their original plan was going to be for him to bowl a lot more. Um, and I'm, you know, I, I think I'm just trying to remember if he, last year. Yeah, so his last three T20s, he's bowled seven overs. He bowled 21 overs in the, in the eight in the year before that. And so they're giving Ben White a go. Ben White has a fantastic record in T20 domestic cricket. That's my memory of Ben White. And I remember because someone asked me about him on a wagon wheel right, because we saw him play in a couple of their test matches. Um, and, and I said that I think he has a long way to go. I think they just need to travel with him. Get him to develop. I, you would probably, what you would love for someone like Ben White would be, and, and this might sound like a step backwards, but you'd really love for him to play club cricket in uh, Melbourne, Sydney, Auckland, somewhere like that for, for, for a while. Just develop his game outside of Ireland and see how he goes. But, you know, he can, he can bowl leg spin. It's just, I don't know how much... Uh, <laughs> I mean, I bowled leg spin on a pitch in Dublin once and got hit for a six. Um, uh, I think uh, at the university ground, uh, the main ground in Dublin, um, it didn't feel like it was the greatest surface. Uh, actually, that might have been AstroTurf. I can't even remember, but I do remember getting hit, hit for six over there. I I would think that if you're if you're looking at how leg spinners would develop, it would not be the most ideal situation for leg spin to develop in. So if they do think they've got something of him, he kind of just needs to travel right and play in other places. Yeah, and the more he plays in the UAE, I suppose, will definitely help him. And uh, maybe if he does well enough, uh, if some franchise T20 gigs come calling, then that could do his limited overs career well. But as you said, if he goes and spends some time playing first class cricket, that's probably the best development he can. Any play. cricket, like, do you know what I mean? Just, I think, for, just for those sorts of guys, you just need to get them out of the system, right? Like, it's you know, uh, uh, with all due respect to Irish cricket, like, it, it it's probably just a little bit too one dimensional. Um, and what what you need what you need for him is if you can get him a crappy T20 contract somewhere, or you know, uh, get him playing club cricket in Sydney or Melbourne or w- whatever that may be, um, you know, that's that's really what he needs at the moment. But you you know, you look at his you, you look at his record um, sort of domestically. So he's played um, as a, as a bowler at the moment. This is his record for Ireland. I don't know if all these are internationals, but his record for Ireland. He's got a bowling average of 21 at 7.4 runs and over. And in domestic cricket in in Ireland, he's done even better. Like he's picking up bags of wickets. He just needs to develop like, mm-hmm. you know, and, and as quickly as possible for them because if, if he's a good leg spinner, that's a huge advantage over Netherlands and Scotland. And those are the other two main European sides that they have to go up against a lot. But also, I promise you, the most important thing for them is that it means the Irish batters will face more leg spin in the nets of a higher quality. And yeah. no cricket team I've ever covered in my life needs to see more leg spin than the Irish cricket team because <laughs> they do play it like it was invented yesterday and they do not understand it. It's a bit like if I threw you a BlackBerry and I told you to rewire it and you'd be like, what's a BlackBerry? Do people still use these? And ha- Ironically, I went to the University of Waterloo and that's where the headquarters were. That's where the BlackBerry was made. So I might manage... I've always seen you as a black brew man. I don't know what that means. 
<laughs> I, I used to have one. I, I used to have one off till after they kind of ran obsolete. But anyway, yeah, good stuff that they have that leg spinner up their ranks. And I mean, if they somehow qualify for the Caribbean leg of the World Cup, that would be great because he could be, you know, of good service. Yeah. But thinking of that World Cup, and this is the final talking point of overthrows today, Ireland are pitted against uh, India, Pakistan, USA, and Canada in their group. And obviously, so they clean sweep for Ireland now. They'll have to upset one of India or Pakistan. And I mean, the last time they played Pakistan in the West in one of those World Cups in, in uh, cricket, well, they, they upset them. Got so, a good time zone. Yeah, definitely good time zone. Uh, unluckily enough, uh, St. Patty's Day is not coinciding with it because it did last time. But I feel like if there's one guy who hypothetically could get them you know, to that next round, it has to be Josh Little, right? He mm. is that X factor, left arm pacer. Got some wickets on this tour as well. Uh, particularly that 3 for 18 in Ireland's win, the only solitary win that they had on this tour. So I feel like if they are to somehow progress, it's going to have to be on the back of Josh Kittle. I don't see any other way. Uh, yeah, I mean, oh, I'm trying to think of another way that it can work. I mean, I suppose Lorcan can have two or three beginnings. We saw the way he played against Australia in that last World Cup. I don't think Sterling's going to win them enough games anymore. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you're probably right, aren't you? Um, but, you know, Josh Little is a good player. <laughs> I mean, he's he's arguably, and this is going to annoy some people in Ireland, but he's arguably the best player Ireland has ever produced already. And I don't mean that to disparage all the great old Irish players because I don't want Alan Lewis sending me a text message. But what I mean is... They've never, they've never been a player who's been able to progress to the level of Josh Little so early on with such a high ceiling that he that he has. Um, so yeah, I mean him. I'm, I still think Mark Adair can rip through some some lineups as well. Um, but yeah, their batting is a little bit more, as we talked about before, a little bit more made of cardboard. So it's not as solid. Yeah. Anyway, we'll take this final super chat before we end overthrows. And Anish has said that he never thought uh, the WPL would take over the streets. You know what? It's fantastic to watch. I mean, I didn't even think that it would generate so much fanfare. I look at my TL and everyone was just going off on the WPL. And I didn't follow the tournament, but learned so much about it. We have a little bit of a segment on this in Uncovered. But uh, just love to see it. I love how the women's game is really you know, uh, garnering interest globally and the WPL can be that league that kind of lights that up on wildfire. Yeah, I did think it would have this kind of interest and I wrote about it in 2018 that it was the biggest mistake that they made not having a women's league. Um, but it's been fantastic. I was at my kid's concert yesterday while the game was on and I was like trying to get my, my phone to connect to the video and sort of in between watching the concert um and watch the game and i couldn't watch it it was so frustrating to me and uh, i just think you know we've seen this with the women's big bash and 100 and everything that the ipl touches women or men is just at a different level right yeah. and so that's what we've seen there and it's been absolutely fantastic seeing the crowds and the interest i had a friend actually contact me and he was complaining and he said god the ipl is about to start and Almost none of the no no writers have done you know really good statistical analysis of all these tournaments. And I said, yeah, but if you look at the women's coverage, it's been absolutely fantastic. So I wonder how many of those people haven't written their IPL previews yet because yeah. they've been off working on the WPL. And you know, if that if even a, a fraction of that is true, that is absolutely massive. Those sorts of things. And you know, when I started working for Crick Info, and I've said this before. In 2012, I covered women's cricket at the 2012 World Cup like it was men's cricket, and I was literally told not to. They were like, it's pointless. There's no there's no, no reason to do this and everything else. And you look at where we are 12 years on, um, and we've still got so far to go, but there's a whole generation of kids growing up now who see women's cricket as just another part of cricket. That was not the case when, you know, me and Bayram and, and, and some of you were kids out there. So it has changed so quickly. It's incredible. Definitely exponential change over there. And I mean, we've mentioned in previous podcasts as well how, you know, they're getting better salaries and a lot of women's cricket isn't professionalized. So a lot of them are amateurs. So maybe we're headed towards a future where, you know, how we talk about the franchise T20 model dominating and kind of overthrowing international cricket, it might happen in the women's game quicker than in the men's.
that's something that we've definitely um, yeah. spoken of earlier. But anyway, on that note, we shall end this episode of Overthrows. And thank you, everyone in the comment section who was um, interacting with us and showed up at this odd hour. We apologize for the delay, of course. There was the PSL final and everything. But we'll be back with another episode of Overthrows next week. That'll be all for today. Goodbye. Thanks and for the kind folks. At Sorry, I went too early with the ad. <laughs> went too early with the ad because I obviously have to tell our viewers that all of you guys who are still with us, stay with us because we're going to be recording uh, or going live with the Uncovered episode right after this short break. So yeah, stay with us. This break, should you want me to press the button? Yeah. Thanks to the kind folks at FlexiSpot for looking after my office and my butt by sending me their E7 Pro desk that save your favorite desk heights at a touch of a button. You don't have to crank anything. This thing just finds the height that you like and you can work. And their BS12 Pro Chair that supports my posterior while I'm recording, well, this ad and all my shows. If you need great desks, especially ones that change heights or the best quality chairs, head on over to FlexiSpot today. Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 76 of the Uncovered Podcast. I'm Bairam Kazi, who you can find at Def Mango on Twitter. And with me is Jared Kimber, who you can find absolutely everywhere. We've got a lot of talking points today. Of course, you guys know that how we've kind of segmented overthrows for on-field stuff and uncovered for off-field stuff. Well, we've got a lot of off-field news this uh, week. And we'll start off by the ICC enforcing the stop clock in uh, white ball international games. This will, of course, uh, start from the 1st of June. So basically, it'll happen for all full member ODI and T20 games. And it will be in effect during the T20 World Cup. That's when we'll see it for the first time. And I'll just kind of give you guys a quick briefing on this. So they did trials. And approximately 20 minutes were saved per ODI mm -hmm. by uh, bringing this sort of innovation in and introducing stop clocks. So it is definitely good in that regard. And the fielding side will have to start uh, a new over within 60 seconds of the completion of the previous over. Of course, there are some exceptions over here. If a new batter is coming in between overs or, you know, there's a drinks break or an injury or time lost for any circumstances beyond the control of the fielding side. Hornets. Make, yeah. Like make a flock that, of hornets. Do, uh, is it a flock will. of hornets? I'm anyway. not sure. Yeah, but but basically anything like that happens with which the feeling side can't control, then they won't get uh, uh, any penalty. But, you know, I like the fact, Jared, that there are two warnings in place. So they fuck up the first time, they get a warning. Second time, they get a warning. Third times onwards, they basically have to incur a five-run penalty for every single breach. And I think this is going to make the game very interesting. Yeah, I think it probably is what it's got. I mean, if, if anyone's ever covered, you know, proper domestic cricket and you probably never have had to you probably only just done PSL and everything else but professional players get through in domestic leagues all the time because they have to because there's proper penalties and they, they lose points and that means they won't you know all these things matter right um and we just haven't created a system in cricket that has done that at the at the top level and this stop clock is the best way to go stop clock is a stupid name because of course in um basketball it's shot clock and hmm. stop clock is just too close to that. Um, I wish they'd come up with it. The overclock. Yeah. The clock over. Um, clock over. <laughs> but I also think they need to do stuff within the overs as well. I think this is just, you know, phase one of this. But, geez, we've been talking about this for a long time of just being able to get to it. There'll be leagues that won't want to do it. I'm always been interested with the IPL because the IPL doesn't seem to really want us, really wants the games to go on for four and a half hours, it feels at times. Um, we just saw a PSL final that went for 17 hours. Um, so I think some leagues won't do it. And so franchise wise, it would be really, really interesting. But from an international point of view, it makes sense. There's, you don't, the biggest problem I think is you don't want to get to a position like baseball where you only change it because literally people have stopped following your sport. Right. And I don't think that was happening in cricket. So better to fix it now while people are moaning about it all the time. Well, yeah, I did polite inquiries. I promise you there was not a day gone by that we didn't get multiple questions about overrates. Hmm. Right. Now, that was a test match show and this isn't test match. cricket, But it's the same thing. And it's like fans absolutely hate this. They feel like they are being cheated. And I understand the whole idea of, you know, other people go, well, as long as the cricket's entertaining, it doesn't matter but the cricket is not always entertaining. So like mm -hmm. you, you do have to do this, but also from my, my, my basic level, I don't want us to get to the level of, as I said before, Mike Hussey running um, back to bowl overs because their teams are short. 
But if you can't manage your time and you can't make decisions within two minutes because you're having 83 conversations, then I'm sorry. That means you're not good enough as, as, as a captain, as a fielding team to be able to get through. And don't get me started on batters asking for a new pair of gloves every over. <laughs> get your manufacturers to make better gloves. It's interesting how I was imagining, you know, how will this exactly play out? And the only way I can kind of see it happening is, you know, if the third umpire is really good with pressing buttons and the timer is on the big screen, you know, it has to be on the big screen so that all the viewers kind of, you know, get to see whether or not there was an actual breach. And uh, I mean, I hope that they are able to kind of educate or at least the teams are able to educate themselves because I'm sure the ICC will put out everything that they need to because uh, there are a lot of instances of tardiness with respect to, you know, restarting overs. So mm. it'll be interesting to see how many of these instances or breaches we get in this T20 World Cup because it is a 20-team World Cup and we've seen in the past how some international teams are on top of these things and some of them just seem like they don't read the rule book, right? Wouldn't it be great if Angelo Matthews was <laughs> bowling <laughs> and it took him too long to bowl his over? It took too long to start his over and just in a game against Bangladesh. If we can manage to make that happen, um, I think that's cricket in perfection. If his lace is broken, and does that oh. fall into the category of uh, things that are beyond the control of the fielding team? If Angelo's lace is broken? Has he told the umpires his laces are broken? That's the question. <laughs> yeah, but that'll be uh, interesting to see. I, I really want to see how this plays out because this is something that I feel will definitely benefit the game. And for people who work in cricket and have to cover these games, we want them to end early. We don't want these games to be prolonged and you guys to be waiting here in the comments section because the PSL final was so long. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I mean... I uh, some games are just going to go long anyway, right? Things things are going to happen. And, you know, as a broadcast, I would say, I don't know how, many, how much commentary you've done, but as a broadcaster, the toughest job is usually an ODI. Mm -hmm. That is a lot of time spent, you know, talking and, and, and working. And you if you get a slow ODI and it goes to, you know, seven and a half, eight, eight and a half hours, it really does, like, it affects the quality of the broadcast and everything else. But we are paid a really good wage to do these things. And, and you know, but that doesn't mean that your energy doesn't go. Have a look at some of Ian Smith's commentary during the last World Cup. But the point being is sometimes it sometimes it can affect the, the drop-offs and when people are watching and everything else. And the biggest thing, the, the NBA All-Star this uh, game this year was delayed by like 50 minutes because the players were pissing about, right? That, that I could be wrong, but that's what it seemed like. If you tell your kid that a game that you they could stay up to the end of a game and the game gets like they, how many kids would have been you could stay up to the end of the PSL we could stay up to the end of it's like and now it's two a.m. Mm -hmm. um, you know <laughs> this game should be for everyone and having really late finishes when you don't need to have really late finishes I think is an issue everything else as I said you know there are two sides to all those different things but that that is something I think cricket should think about that the first one is are fans turning off because they're frustrated. And the second one is, um, can, you know, are, are we are we making it harder for kids to watch the end of games just because it was scheduled to finish at 9.30, but it's actually finished at 11. Speaking of which, not just 2 a.m., 2 a.m. on a Monday night. So good job, PSL schedulers. Anyway, Anish has uh, sent his second super chat of the day. He's saying, or asking who is going to stop India's home test juggernaut. I'm sure someone will win at some point who and when. I think that when Ravi Chandran Ashwin retires and Jadeja is not around, that's kind of when we'll get to see that happen. That was an interesting way you put that. One of them is retiring and the other one's not around. Um, yeah, because he's always injured. He's always injured uh, and he's okay. also a politician now, right? So he, maybe he has some politics to do on the side. I don't know. Um, I don't. If, if you're asking, Anish, there is no team that I'm looking at in world cricket that is about to come and beat India or in India. You would need to work out, Well, you need at least one better than Nathan Lyon level spinner. And I don't know if anyone else ever has that yet, you know, peak Yassir Shah type spinner. Mm -hmm. um, then you also need the batting to be able to back that up. And probably also a bowler who is an expert in, in reverse swing or, you know, that the sort of impact that Boomer can give you. I don't see that team out there. Um, maybe if there's some young South African spinners I'm not aware of that are coming through or some other team, but I don't see a team that. So you, the only way to beat to, for India to, to struggle would be their own natural decline. And mm -hmm. Jaiswal looks pretty handy. So 
you know, and there's some young batting talent coming through. Maybe the seam bowling is declining a little bit. And as, as, um, Bayram just said, maybe the spinners, although, you know, cool deeps probably got another five or six years, um, going through Akshar probably wouldn't want to make up for lost time. Um, you know, Washington Zunda still hasn't developed fully yet. So there's still plenty of talent out there. So I don't see a natural drop off for India and I don't see a natural rival for them in Indian conditions right at the moment. Oh, wait a minute. Hasaranga's just come out of retirement. So India, uh, yeah. Sri Lanka will beat them. <laughs> yeah. If they pretty much play like 10 batters and, and Hasaranga, maybe then they have a chance. But yeah, I mean, it, the, the gulf in quality in those sort of conditions is so huge when it comes to India and any other side. So I just don't see it happen in the near future. The last time it happened, was it 2012 when England did it? They had a peak Swan and Monty do well for them. And it was also a bit of a transitional phase for Indian cricket, wasn't it, yeah. that period? So, but yeah, I mean, England probably had the best chance because of all the injuries and parental leave yep. and all sorts of things in this particular series they you know it would have been interesting if australia had gone over at, at the same time on those wickets maybe they could have done that but i i just don't see a team going back there and beating them at the moment yeah when do australia go there next i don't know they're there every eight minutes they might have just played a test series and we missed it for all we know like it's there's <laughs> so, so so many of them it was funny someone recently said you know you, you cover every indian game i go i don't even cover every australia indian game because they play so many that like at a certain point you just have to check out and go oh someone did made some runs did they yeah not long ago we had these complaints that why are you covering these minnow series and then you're saying you cover every india game what do you guys want i, but... <laughs> I cover everything at all times that's what i cover <laughs> yeah anyway another thing that the icc kind of uh, you know stipulated for this t20 world cup and i don't agree with this one i think that this one is flawed is that you need to have 10 overs in the second innings for dls to kick in and people or, or for us to get a result in games now there is rain in that part of the world. Why are you giving us more no results? That's what it sounds like to me. Um, I don't think five overs is enough for a cricket game. Mm. So are you I, fine with the 10 overs thing? So I understand it, I suppose, is the best way of putting it. Have we had, uh, but, but having said that, have we had any really rogue results from a five over game in a World Cup so far? I mean, we probably have in bilaterals. Um, <sighs> Probably, I probably would have gone seven or eight um, if, if I was doing it. I, you know, the, the, the idea of just making it this, you know, um, the same as ODI cricket probably doesn't make as much sense, I wouldn't have thought, in, in, in that level. Um, but yeah, the, I mean, one of the more ridiculous cricket games I've ever seen was South Africa, Zimbabwe, when mm. then no one should have been on that field. And they were, umpires were trying to push through for five overs. It was absolutely not fit for international cricket um, at all, that game. Maybe that is that is it making it harder for umpires to do that if it's ten overs? I I don't know, um, but yeah, I, I'm not as anti it as you are, but I probably would have picked a slightly different number if it was me. I think that's fair. If if they'd gone with like seven, I wouldn't have had that big of an issue. Prady asks and and a very generous super chat yeah, uh, thank donation you. as well. Thank you to you, Prady. Uh, Dobell keeps mentioning an asterisk against England's away series during COVID because of how hard it was. How fair is that? Is it an excuse? There are other teams that won away during COVID. Interesting question. I think England did more touring and did more bubble work than anyone else. And I do know that I know I know Australian players laugh at England when they go on about this, but I do know from having spoken to people in the England camp, it did affect them. Now, I the reason I wouldn't put an asterisk on this is if you go back to the bubble of the NBA there were teams that did not handle being in the bubble of the NBA. And then there are other teams that are like, this is the greatest thing ever. All we have to do is sleep in, wake up and play basketball. And we don't have to travel and we don't have to worry about anything else. And we're all hanging out together and this is great. And we'll see our families when hopefully we win the championship or not. That's part of the gig. Sometimes it is tough, right? And, and if you're an England cricketer, you know, English cricketers usually spend more time traveling than any other cricketers. That is part of, of what it is. So I would not agree we're putting an asterisk against it um, because I do think other teams had to do it and other teams had to do it while being paid a fraction of what the England players were being paid. And this isn't all about money, but you know, there was a lot of West Indian players who came over. They came from islands where there were, <laughs> there were less people on their islands than they were dying on a daily rate in England or in a weekly rate in England from COVID. And they came over for not very much money to play in those situations. Um, and I don't think I've never heard any of them talk about having an asterisk on their conditions 
mm. on, on their cricket. So, I, but I understand, but, but as I said, I understand George's point, but that that's part of dealing with the shitness of, of touring, whether it be COVID, whether it be fame, whether, you know, there are cricketers who cannot stand the fact that they can't leave their hotel rooms in places like Bangladesh and India and, and Pakistan. Mm. They cannot stand it because they're not hotel room people. Right. And there are other players who will have, you know, who are like, wait, there's a hotel in the ground and I have a personal chef. This is the greatest moment of my life. Plug in my FIFA box um, and, and call me when it's time for me to hit the nets. And, and so different teams handle things differently. And, you know, we know the England team when they when they did the bubble to South Africa for the one day is <laughs> the South Africans were like, what? We can't make you. you know, um, we can't give you facilities where you can play golf every day. But the England players are like, we won't go anywhere where there's no golf. Right, everyone is different, and all those situations. So I wouldn't put an asterisk on on it, but I also wouldn't say it wasn't normal life, right? And everyone reacted to it differently. But I think, as we've seen a lot of times, England players usually gets rinsed by their board, um, and maybe that affected them more. Yeah, I mean, if I think of Pakistan, uh, Mizbah led the team to number one in the Test rankings, not playing at home, so that team was always touring. So yep. I mean, there's no asterisk over there either, right? So. Yeah, I, I just. I mean, there, I mean, there is though, because we do mention that sort of stuff. So you can put the asterisks in if you want, but it doesn't stop the fact that you have to win or lose. It's mm. tough to win consistently in Test cricket when you're away in any conditions, right? Like that's just part of the gig. Anyway, we got another super chat from Jonathan Braun, and uh, it's an IPL question. He asks, "Do you ex expect Rachin Ravindra to replace Devon Conway at the top of the order for CSK? How good do you think he could be in that role?" Hmm. no i don't i wouldn't have i wouldn't have thought that is going to happen and you know the, it's not that uh, ratchet ravindra is not a fantastic cricketer um it's more to do with the fact that last year devon conway averaged 50 <laughs> so like if i know devon conway's gone through a bit of a crisis in test cricket and and hasn't made as many runs overall as he has but i think knowing the way that chennai select they're probably not going to dump him straight away, right? Yeah. I actually think that Ratchin and uh, Daryl Mitchell are probably more fighting for a position. I, obviously, it's probably going to go to Daryl Mitchell just because they paid mm. him an absolute fortune. But yeah. um, the one thing I would say that is in Ratchin's uh, advantage is the fact that he can bowl more than Daryl, or his bowling is going to be more useful in India. Uh, Daryl Mitchell's probably a better bowler than Ratchin Ravindra, but when, when, <laughs> that's just my personal take. Um, but he's not going to bowl much in the IPL. He's not going to be of much use bowling in the IPL. And we know that um, India, uh, the, India, who are we talking about? Chennai really love yeah. their multiple all-rounders and flexibility of lineup and all that sort of stuff and you know batting down to a number 11 and everything if they can get an over and a half two overs out of a guy who bats at you know number four number five and we still know that and we know Ratchin can make runs in india now um then there is an opportunity there that they might do that but devon conway has earned his spot i don't know what his overall I mean, record he is. is injured right now but like you yes. mentioned Daryl Mitchell is probably the guy they'll go to. Look, they'll probably play Tikshana. Uh, they'll be tempted to play Santner at times, but they've got Jadeja. Moin Ali as well? Yeah, yeah, I would yeah. say uh, they've, they've liked to go to Moin because he gives them, you know, uh, flexibility with both bat and ball and the oh. surfaces suit him. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, I, if, they've, if they come up against right-hand dependent teams, Ratchet becomes really important. But just because of the way that the pitches rag over there, they can maybe get an over and over and a half out of him. Maybe um, they you... play him uh, as opener whenever they play RCB in Bangalore. Yeah. <laughs> so, but but uh, Devin Conway, just I just had a look here. His record in the IPL in what's his twenty three games is nine hundred and twenty four runs, an average of forty eight, and a strike rate of one hundred and forty one. He he's earned another full season at the top of the order, unless he you know doesn't can't make it, hit the ball off the square. Would be my guess. Yeah. I mean, that's next season, right? Because he won't be playing this one pretty much. Um, all right, Anisha. Yeah, says, yeah. I mean, wait. I mean, even, but, but I suppose my point is, if Ratchin comes in and opens the batting and and does very very well, like you, you're not going to get rid of the guy who averaged fifty, are you? Yeah, definitely not. And and I mean, Stephen Fleming is the coach, so I'm not surprised that uh, this is shaping up to be somewhat Chennai Super Kiwis. As hey. some people have been calling it, yeah. Uh, Anish has sent his third super chat of the day. He says, "What's the reason for PSL final scheduled on Monday?" So I was going to ask you that. This is not the first time they've done this. This happened last year as well, and last year it seemed like some political uh, angle 
uh, to moving the final to Monday. But this year, I simply feel that uh, it's incompetence, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> so, they didn't the realize it was a Monday. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, no. I'll tell you exactly where the incompetence probably kicked in. This is, of course, my theory, but it kind of checks out because I was thinking about this. So the PSL happens dead in the middle of uh, the IPL on one end. So it's bookended by the IPL. And then those four leagues that happen in tandem in January, right? The uh, SA20, ILT20, Big Bash, some of it, and the Bangladesh Premier League. So they want to have a dedicated window for the PSL where there's mm. no other franchise T20 cricket happening, which I understand. I actually get that. And... In a way, they want to kind of attract top talent as well, but top talent kind of wants to take a break before the IPL. So it's an interesting predicament mm. over there. But I feel like they were like, oh, this is the day the ILT20 ends. Let's schedule the first game right away. And what they didn't factor in is that come playoffs, they're going to have to have four consecutive playoff games. Or of yeah, that is that is correct. Four consecutive playoff games. And then the team that wins the eliminator would have played three games in a row, you know, on three consecutive games. And that was just not feasible because you don't want to basically kill those players. Uh, T20, sure, it's 40 overs a day, but it's still a very hectic format because you have to kind of put a lot of energy into it and it's high octane. So to give those players a break who are coming from the eliminator, that's why I believe the PSL moved the final to a Monday. And it's a stupid, stupid thing to do because you could have just moved everything back one more day had you thought this through. But they clearly didn't think this through. And that's why uh, it took us so long to start this show because the final was today. Uh, I, I do wonder what the future of those events are because there wasn't much crowd. But was the crowd due to other factors or was it the Monday, do you think? So the Pindi games were full houses, right? And they always yeah. are. Rahul Pindi turns up for a dead rubber test uh, because I remember Bangladesh were touring once and the first two, three days were washed out. They had full houses in the remainder of the test match. So both those two days. So they, they love the cricket in Pindi. And also it's uh, the you're closer to the action when you're in the enclosures. So there's not a lot going in between in terms of like fences and that sort of stuff. Multan is a smaller center, so you always get full houses over there because people are, you know, they're thirsty for, for high-level cricket. Lahore is Lahore, and uh, it's just one of those places in the subcontinent which is very, you know, uh, festival-like. Everyone loves to have a good time, so they turn up and they love the Lahore Kalandas. It's actually a partisan crowd with the Lahore Kalandas. They don't care about the opposition. If you go to other places in Pakistan, the opposition gets lots of plaudits. Even international teams that come over here are always surprised by that. Lahore, when they are cheering on their own team in the PSL, don't do that for every, anyone else. Karachi have a shit team in the PSL, for starters. And also, uh, I don't know which one is heavier over here in terms of contributing factors, but A, it's in a hotbed, the stadium. So there are two mm -hmm. universities, uh, two uh, hospitals, one naval base, lots and lots of people, right, you know, across uh, that area, like encircling the stadium. So that area is trafficy as is, and then you put in PSL security and tons of mm. people. And then also there are, you know, big barbed fences in Karachi Stadium. So you have to sit at an elevated seat. Otherwise your viewing experience is screwed. A lot of people who are here from India will kind of understand how pillars can be, uh, you know, very, very bothering when you're watching a game and, and Karachi has that issue. So, I have been told by many people that, oh, it's uh, because it takes a lot of energy to get there and we're just not, you know, willing to expend all of that energy. And also the viewing experience and the fan experience is garbage. Now, they turn up to other centers. So I think it's more so to do with fan experience than the other stuff. But they filled it up today. It was a house full, right? So I don't know what exactly it is, but the PSPCB need to fix this because there's a Champions Trophy coming. And fingers crossed, it is hosted entirely in Pakistan. Karachi is a major cricketing city. People in Karachi love their cricket. I don't, I'm not willing to buy the notion that they've lost interest. So that's something they need to fix. And it was definitely something that uh, was a very poor look on the PSL, that you're having these playoffs and your top players are playing and, and the crowd isn't there. And luckily enough, uh, the last two games were better. Uh, no, it's interesting. Um, Simon Nathan's put in a comment um, saying that it's uh, it's like the US elections. I'm hoping, though, it's not like the US elections. They didn't set it up on, on a random day so that working class people can't um, come and watch yeah. it. So it's yeah. a little anyway, bit different from that point of view. Mit Mitran Mahler Vanan, I'm so sorry if I butchered your name over there, Mitran. Uh, he asks, pre-COVID Roots team had similar win percentage to Stokes. Say what? Um... 
Really? They were well. They were better. I mean, there was a time when they were playing okay. Um, if if if, if that's what he means, um, let's have a look. I can probably bring this up very very I mean, quickly. Ben Stokes has lost what um, eight Test matches in two years. Take the India series out, and that's a pretty good looking record. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they they were doing fantastic. So let's just have a look. Uh, I'm trying to remember when freaking COVID was, um, which is the most important thing here. But uh, in their win win loss record, uh, so when was COVID? 2021. Uh, so March 2020 in- is when the uh, glo- knock uh, not knockdowns lockdown started. So 2019 was before COVID, correct? We can all agree on that. Yep. England won four Test matches and lost six. So that's not a better t- win percentage. No, that they were they were struggling before that. They had they had some good runs. They're, look, they're very similar to South Africa when they when they play a bunch of average teams in a row. Um, you know, they they win a lot of games. And if I'm not mistaken, so tw- you said 2020 was the start of um, yeah. What uh, what 20, do we call 20 it? March March 2020 is when it started. So at the start in 2020, they actually did really really well that year. Um, so 2019, they struggled when they played slightly better teams. Uh, 2020, uh, they did really well at the start of lockdown. Um, and then in 2021, you know, they played 15 test matches. They won four and they lost nine. So if you look at COVID as an entire COVID bubble, they played 24 test matches. They won 10, um, and they lost 10. So they were a 50, 50, um, team, but against the best sides, let's be honest, they weren't particularly that special they didn't look good when they played australia um they didn't particularly look good when they played um india also yeah there were times against the west indies um so you know uh there's there's i i I won't have it that they haven't looked better when they played baseball than they did before it's just it's fundamentally not true they're still a weak side they're still a spasmodic side that i don't expect consistency from um uh but yeah uh, this, this this idea that um, it's all COVID related or that under Root they were doing well, Root lost the plot, right? Like he, he completely lost the plot as a captain. And that wasn't just COVID. He was really, really struggling with the job. He even sacked uh, Jimmy and Broad and that entire thing happened, right? That was an incredible um, moment. Yeah. Anyway, Anish with yet another super chat says, do you guys think the Champions no. Trophy will be held in Pakistan? Yeah, I also have my fears because we saw what happened with the Asia Cup. And if there is to be a hybrid solution, I hope that, and this is me being wishful, I'm not having or pinning any hopes on it. I hope that if it is to be in hy- a hybrid solution, India play their games in Dubai and everything else happens in Pakistan. But let's kind of, you know, keep our fingers crossed on this because I, I don't know what to tell you. All right, Mitran again asks, they beat South Africa 3-1 away, beat India 4-1 at home. Yep, they beat South Africa 3-1 away. Uh, away. That was a absolute trash South African team that was losing the plot internally. Um, and I was at that series. I, if you're if you're thinking that that series means anything, I'm sorry, it did not. Uh, they beat India 4-1 at home. I thought India played really well and could have easily stolen a couple of extra games. No, it's saying that they were always terrible. But do you want me to just go back and read that record? Like, do I really need to read this out, out loud again? Like, in, in 2019, they were not... A particularly good cricket team and that's just a, a fact of, of what happened I, I don't know what what else you want us to say they they wasn't just a COVID thing they were struggling beforehand like um so if you go back uh let's have a look at uh let's have a look at english cricket so let's go back to the start of 2018 right hmm. so the start of 2018 if we forget the ashes there we go to new zealand they uh they lost a series in new zealand uh they then um uh, did they play pakistan in they played pakistan in 2020 what about 2018 did they play pakistan in 2018 did they visit um oh my God. uae no i think australia came to the uae in 2018 if i'm not wrong oh wait a minute i might have got the wrong i oh, know now I've completely clicked the wrong thing. No, I've got England. Just making sure I was looking at England's record and not some other random teams for a minute there. Um, uh, so, yeah, let's just quickly go through this. So 2018, um, they they lost to New Zealand over there. 
Uh, then they played Pakistan at Lords and Leeds in 2018. They that lost one, one. They lost the test match. Yeah. They lost the test match there, right? Muhammad so, Abbas, yeah, I remember. Yeah. That. Um, they then played India in 2018. As you said, they did really well in that series. They went to Sri Lanka. I thought they played really well in that series. They went to West Indies and they lost. And England fans always say, "Oh, but they always go to West Indies and lost." Yep, they lost. They should have lost a. Was it 2019 they played Ireland for the first time and, um, and almost lost that game? Yeah. Right? They're absolutely pathetic in that test match. The uh, Murder game. Incredibly lucky to draw the series um, against Australia um, in 2019. And really, Australia crapped the bed there. As I said, they beat South Africa, uh, lost that first test, and then came back. Was that the first test? Uh, yeah, lost the first test and then came back there. That was not a good South African team. Uh, they then lost a test to West Indies at home. So I'm just going through. That's the first. I think that's the first COVID test. That's a lot of like, what are we talking about there? Like that is not the record of a very, very good team. They were struggling so much and it gets way worse after then. And if you want to put an asterisk on the COVID stuff, that's fine. But they were not a consistently good team before then. I've been covering that team all the way through that period. They were like, I was laughing at how bad they were at times, um, even when they were beating other teams. So anyway, uh, yeah. another super chat from VK. VK says, hello, Behram and Jared. Always enjoy your show and appreciate how unbiased you both are. Can you pick four overseas players for Sunrise's Hyderabad? We've done this like five times. and I literally Everyone wants to know this now. one. Everyone I've, wants to know this one, don't they? Anyone but Pat thing. Cummins. Don't pick Pat yeah. Cummins would be my, my selection. I think my picks were Hasaranga, Glenn Phillips, Heinrich Klaassen, and Aidan Markram. Those are the four I went with. Obviously, Pat Cummins is going to play. He's captain. Yeah. I, uh, so who do you, you've got Hasaranga, Klaassen. So those two are automatics for me. And you've got Markram. Yes. And you've got Glenn, Glenn Phillips. Phillips. So, yeah, they probably won't have Glenn Phillips, will they? They'll probably have uh, Cummins instead of, uh, instead of him. I, I can't remember if, if there was any others out there. But, yeah. Travis Head. They've got Travis Head as well. Travis Head. I feel like there's one other player I'm missing as well. Uh, but yes. Marco, Marco Janssen. He's in. Yeah. Marco Janssen is the other one. Yeah. So, no, it would probably be Cummins and and Klaassen and Hasaranga and then uh, one of the other batters. Maybe they will go for Head or, or you know, depending on what they're looking for. Um, head gives you, I suppose, a little bit of bowling. I suppose Markram does as well. They're probably not that much different yeah. in bowling. Uh, but, yeah, it's incredible how often this question comes up. I mean, the truth is, I, I've just, you know, just been doing the numbers. Um, it it's remarkable how bad they were. Let's see if I've got them here so I can go through them. Um, it is absolutely remarkable at just how bad sunrises were. So I have them as negative, and this is on my rating system. I have them on negative on power play batting, 26% worse than normal. I have them as par and middle order batting. I have them 6% worse on death batting. I have them as 2% worse on power play bowling, 13% worse on middle overs bowling, and 7% um, better on death bowling. I just don't think Pat Cummins is going to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> Hasaranga might help, right? But I just just don't think that, you know. Let's just say that if the Sunrisers were playing a four-day competition, I would understand them making Pat Cummins their captain. Because interestingly enough, and this is a natural segue, Australia have moved away from Pat Cummins as their T20 captain. And Sunrisers have, have gone for him because Australia, like, they haven't penciled this in just yet, but it's more more or less a done deal that Mitch Marsh will be leading the side yeah. uh, in the T20 World Cup in the USA and Caribbean. So they've even stepped away from Pat Cummins, but the Sunrisers have paid a truckload of money for him. He's the second most lucrative purchase in IPL history, and he's also going to be leading the side. So I don't know what they're smoking, but I'd like some. <laughs> it's, look, I mean, I don't, I, I don't really understand it. I think Australia have made the right move. I think Pat Cummins was overburdened with captaining all three. He's now got yeah. wins right across the board. So he's kind of, you know, um, cemented himself from that point of view. Um, I think he's probably at his weakest in T20 cricket. Um, yeah. And so gives them flexibility where they don't have to play him. And they've got other, you know, Spencer Johnson and Jai Richardson is hopefully going to be fit again. And, you know, other players coming through that they can, they can trial and everything else. And um, it just gives them a flexibility in the way that the Sunrisers have given themselves no flexibility. The worst thing you can do is pick an overseas captain for a franchise team who is not an automatic selection um, for all every game going in unless they're injured. Um, yeah. But forgetting that, I think, you know, from that point of view, I, I, Pat, I, 
I, I'd be shocked if Pat Cummins is not the sort of person that George Bailey, uh, Andrew McDonald, Mitch Marsh can't go to and go, Pat, we love you. You're not bowling great. Can we just rest you for this game so we can try an extra spinner? Or can we just, maybe we're going to pick an all-rounder in, you know, Aaron Hardy. I knew you'd like that. Um, uh, you know, whatever it may be, they try something a little bit different and, and go with that kind of, uh, you know, uh, Ashton Agar, um, a player, whoever it may be for a particular game. It gives them more flexibility. That was part of the problem during the World Cup. Like, uh, Pat Cummins is now seen as this legend because of what he did in the World Cup final. Yeah, I was there in the semifinal. Not, not so much. I was there for many of the other games where he was the worst, one of the worst bowlers Australia had. You know, that was ODI cricket, which I think he's more suited to as well. So, um uh, I, I think it's a good move from Australia. And you know, I, he's not going to be annoyed. He's yeah. still going to be part of the squad. He's such a talented player. No one's going to get rid of him, but it just gives Australia a little bit more flexibility. And you know, it's part of the incredible development of Mitch Marsh. Um, you know, I've said this story before, but you know, I remember a young Mitch Marsh um, uh, asking me to send a, a tweet to a woman on Twitter um, about the time he got hit in the balls by, um, I don't know how he thought this was going to help him get lucky, by the way. Um, he's just developed so much as a human being and as a player over that. Time. And, you know, he, I, I do think he's probably a natural sort of, you watch the way he bowls and it's clear that he really thinks about the game a lot. And he's got holes in his game and we know that, but he's done so well. So um, I think it's a fascinating move by Australia and, and probably a good one in many different ways yeah i mean back on pat cummins i don't think he'll be complaining at all because he won the t20 world cup as a player then the world test championship and the odi world cup as a captain and retained the ashes in england so after that he's bagged the second most lucrative deal in ipl history so he won't be complaining if australia arrest him in should t20 be fine games. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. should be fine. And and Mitch Marsh is not someone who's going to be captaining the side out of the blue. He's been captaining the side in these fringe series here yeah. and there, T20s and ODIs. And it's interesting how I never saw him as this leadership figure. You know, the Bison was always this casual, in his own world, kind of hunky-dory sort of personality. But now I see how, you know, maybe they see him as this liberating factor where everyone can go and play their game. And that's how Australia should be playing T20 cricket. So this could really be a, a, a great move by Australia because if you look at the team on paper, they've got some really, really hard-hitting players in there. I mean, Tim David is one of the most sought-after commodities in the shortest format. So I expect Mitch Marsh to do a good job. I Yeah, I mean, I need to see a lot more of his captaincy before I, I would be massively concerned. But I didn't think Pat Cummins was a great captain tactically either. So um, I don't, it's not like, you know, you going from MS Dhoni to a can of tuna, right? Like it's, yeah. I, I would assume. So it, no, I think it'll be interesting. Anyway, on that note, uh, let's take a short break. We have Am more. Am I talk live about. and Bayram's not live? Or is Am I live? Bayram live, and I'm not. Live. I can, I can hear you. <laughs> can you guys hear us? <laughs> no clue. I'm here. I know I'm here. I'm here as well. So who do you guys see? <laughs> uh, can you hear me, Jared? I can definitely hear you. Okay, so I think we're good then. And on this note, let's take a short break. We have more to talk about on Uncovered. You're with Bayram and Jared, and yeah, uh, go see this ad, and we'll join you shortly after. Thanks to the kind folks at FlexiSpot for looking after my office and my butt by sending me their E7 Pro desk that save your favorite desk heights at a touch of a button. You don't have to crank anything. This thing just finds the height that you like and you can work. And their BS12 Pro chair that supports my posterior while I'm recording, well, this ad and all my shows. If you need great desks, especially ones that change heights or the best quality chairs, head on over to FlexiSpot today. Welcome back to Uncovered. You are with Behram and Jared. And uh, one of the more sad news that came out recently, uh, we of course know that Harry Brook uh, pulled out of the Test Series versus India. And now he's also withdrawn himself from the IPL. It's caused a bit of an uproar or, or you know, uh, people have not taken to this news kindly uh, because uh, there is this notion that England kind of pulls out their players from the IPL. And I understand that. But, uh, you know, he kind of gave everyone an explanation of how he was super close to his grandmother who had a strong influence on him and why he even took up the sport in the first place. He's lost his grandmother. He, he's grieving and he's mourning. And he's just not in the right frame of mind to pick up a bat yet. So I think people should give him ample time and respect that decision. But clearly Akash Chopra is coming on and saying that, uh, hey, pick English players in the IPL at your own peril. 
which I think was a tone deaf tweet in the context of things and ill timed. Yeah, I don't know how much information he had when he made that uh, comment um, uh, at the time, but I happen to have met Harry Brooke's grandmother randomly, oh. and she is she was a huge part of his his life and his career. And um, as someone who had a very special relationship with my grandmother, that I don't think other people would have understood. Um, uh, I can understand why he would be in that place. But if you're using that as part of your narrative about players from certain countries, that's just bullshit, right? Because yeah. um, Vera Coley just missed a test series uh, because of a baby. And there are other players who would have missed maybe a test for that, right? And that's fine. No problem with Vera Coley doing that. He put his family first. You know, there were, there were obviously issues going on around the birth and all these sorts of things. And he did that. And we can't support Vera Coley and then slag off. Harry Brook, like, and this is the second time this has happened yeah. recently, right? And, you know, we can't say that Ashwin is doing a great thing in the middle of a test match and that and that Harry Brook is doing the wrong thing. Like, everyone grieves and handles things differently. And if you can't handle that, I, I don't know what to say to people who can't do that. And I'm not having a go at Akash because, as I said, I don't know when he yeah. sent his tweet and everything else. But I'm saying in general, like, it just feels like people have got, you know, uh, um, agendas. It's like, this isn't about an agenda. This isn't about his nationality. This is about him as a person and what has happened, uh, you know, with with a family member and how it's affected him. And he doesn't want to go out and play. And I think we've talked about this before, probably with a similar, probably when Ashwin or, or Brooke or whoever it yeah. was last time. I think it was Coley and Brooke because uh, that's what happened at the start of the series, right? The test yeah. series. Um, and yeah, I, know, I know players who want to go out and play when these things happen. Yeah. And I know players who don't want to do it. Um, yeah. And... You have to deal with your life in the way that you do, and for other people to be, you know, pejorative or you know, or to use you as part of a a, a cultural war on cricket Twitter, it's just fuck off, right? Like that's just yeah. that's not what this is. This is a human being who lost someone close to him, and he's not ready to play cricket at the moment. Everyone is different. Everyone is different, and culture wars are exhausting just to read anywhere, <laughs> not just Twitter, but honestly, like. I went to Canada, interacted with people from all over the globe. And I mean, treat people as people. Don't make it an us versus them thing. I keep saying the same thing over and over again on different platforms. Uh, someone has said that I think Chopra meant about Roy. Well, Chopra timed his tweet literally an hour after the Harry Brook news. So you have to kind of, if when you were a public figure, you have to think about, you know, are you displaying a lack of empathy? Because that's not a good look. And, and I think that empathy is a big part of our lives, not just sport. And you have to take care of or, or take that into consideration because like Jared said, everyone deals with these sort of things differently. And I've also lost two grandmothers who I was really close to. So I get it, right? Like you don't really want to do anything. You feel like just talking to no one and, and staying in your room and looking at an old photo album. That's what you kind of feel like doing. So you have to give people the space to cope with loss or any sort of adversity, you know, in the way that suits them best. And if Harry Brook does not want to play cricket right now and wants to heal, then so be it. He doesn't owe anyone anything. He's not going to get paid by Delhi, right? They've already signed uh, Fraser McGurk as a replacement. So I don't think this is a big issue. And, you know, if you're talking about you know, impeding the IPL. Well, look at what happens in other T20 leagues across the world. It's all impeding, right? Uh, these things happen that this player is available for six games yeah. and he's gone. You know, so it's it's a noble thing. Don't don't make it into some nationalistic bullcrap. Um, anyway, there's other news, um, this time from Pakistan. So Jared, Shane Watson was actually coaching the Quetta Gladiators this time around. And, uh, you know, so Pakistanis... They get a boner whenever uh, some Australian comes and works with their players. This is a very real thing. And Watto is much loved over here. Of course, he came to Pakistan as a player to play the PSL when yep. you know it was harder uh, for Pakistan to attract international stars to, to tour the country. So there is that sense of uh, attachment and, and uh, love with respect to Watto. And Watto kind of you know, laid out his terms where he was like, okay, I can do the job, but I want to get paid a half a million US dollars in a year. And the PCB quadrupled the amount and said, we'll pay you 2 million US dollars a year. And then it fell through. He snubbed them because obviously he probably wants to spend time with family, has some commentary gigs, maybe some franchise stuff as well. But all in all, the PCB <laughs> kind of came out of this looking like absolute losers. And that's a challenge right now. They're fixated on a foreign coach and all these grade A foreign coaches like Mike Hessen, Andy Flower, they are you know, in that space where coaching a franchise team for 
a few months in the year is an easier yeah. less pressure job and it's just it makes more sense for them so i don't know what the pcb is trying to doing over here uh, um, this is actually a story about sri lanka but it's it's obviously similar i i've had a lot of friends who've been offered jobs in sri lankan cricket and they're like okay so i stop my franchise gigs i go over and i'm the head coach of of, of sri lanka we we win a couple of series maybe we win two out of our four series that i start off with then the next two series we're going up against india and india and australia and australia we lose them then we go to the west indies and we split that one nil and then we go to pakistan and we, and we lose two one or something right i'm gonna lose my job hmm? it doesn't matter that i've made the team better or not because that's not how things will be looked at yeah and we've just had mickey arthur put the job together exactly as he wanted it it was put together for him by him you know we had a huge you know podcast episode about it how interesting it was and and everything else but the truth is that that fell through and so shane watson just doesn't feel comfortable then you've got the other stuff you know i've you know i obviously i know mickey arthur but i know was him khan a little bit as well was him khan was not ready for the amount of personal vitriol now there are a lot of pakistani fans who don't like him i get that he wasn't oh, he, everyone i interact with says oh wasim khan was the best and i liked him too they say that a lot more now than they did at the time hmm. um but his but his salary was leaked to the press um you know details about his private life were leaked to the press it's not a normal job right that isn't happening if no i mean no one cares if you're the coach of the Sunrises. They've had, no one even knows who the coach of the Sunrises is. On a day-to-day -day basis, no person in, in, in the cricket world can tell you who the Sunrises coach is. They've had three coaches today, from what I can tell, right? That's not the case if you're the coach of the Pakistan team. And, and Sri Lanka is, is similar, but in, in a different way. And you're always under pressure. You are always dealing with external um, uh, parts that just don't help you do the job correctly. And, you know, I occasionally get asked, I, I've never been offered a major job, but I occasionally get asked, would you be interested in being, you know, an analyst for a team like Sri Lanka or a team like Bangladesh or a, a team like Pakistan? And, and I'm like, well, what position would I be in? Hmm. Right? Like, if I take that job, I have to stop everything else. And I can't guarantee I'm going to be there all that long. And I don't, I don't have the, the sway of a coach to be able to get money back later on and all those sorts of things. And I also have to deal with the pressure. And I, so I completely get it. I'm, I, I was actually sh shocked that Watto took it as far as he did. I just, I don't know him at all personally. Never met him in my life. Uh, you know, I've interviewed him, but never met him. Um, I don't know how he would have handled that kind of a situation and whether it would have suited him or not. I know he wouldn't make $2 million a year from cricket work outside of, of that, as it is at the moment. He might in the future, but I don't think he would be at the moment. But would it would it be better for his work life balance? Would it be better for his mental health? Would it be better for his family? Probably not. And that's what I coaches mean, are now thinking. He had Sean Tate as bowling coach with him in Quetta, and he probably gave him a lot of insight, right? Because Tate was there with Pakistan not too long ago, and he was treated really poorly. And the media treated him really poorly. I was an oppressor with Sean Tate, and they were asking him questions where he was just firing back right at them, and I was scared when it came to me and my question, but he answered my question really well. You guys can go <laughs> take it up or whatever. Did he like me? But, you know, it's not just uh, the volatility. Of course, the PCB have a new chairman every week. And yeah, that's what like I mean. Four different guys hold the post in the last year or something. Uh, it's directly intertwined, the PCB, with the government, government of Pakistan, and that's had so much volatility. So there is no security whatsoever. It's insecurity central. And I, I've got a friend at the moment. I've got a friend at the moment who has a coaching job. And... There's like a few things that have changed around the, the domestic board that he's working at. And so he was saying to me, I'm going to lose, I might lose my job, not because I haven't been a good coach, but because, you know, there's a few different movements around here. And because of that, they might think that they want to try a new direction. Right. And, and I was saying, geez, you know, and he goes, he said, yeah, it's not the end of the world. I've got this contract. They will pay me. They probably won't pay me my full amount of my contract. Right. But they will give me a lump sum to get rid of me so that they can bring another coach in and so that I don't make a big, any big issues for them. The stuff, sort of stuff that you're talking about, we know that that doesn't always happen, right? Like the money that is promised doesn't always tr trickle down to these people. There are issues there are, and, and, and you know, this is a big problem in franchise cricket, but it's also a big problem with these other things. You, you sign up for a two-year deal for two million a year, 
what about in three months' time if you lose that job? I mean, who knows what yeah. Muhammad Afiz and Mahab Riaz and all these, you know, Selman Butt was involved five minutes ago. Like, it's a yeah. shit show over there. How do you yeah. know you're going to be working in that job for five it's months? It's an understatement to call it a shit show. Absolute understatement. Like, remember how Mickey and Brad Burns were still being paid and they didn't go to Australia with the team? Like, that's where we're at right now. What at least I got paid. Would, <laughs> yeah, what sort of coach would want to come into this sort of setup? Especially, you know, look... Pakistan uh, right now is a team of, uh, you know, you've got some talented individuals, but it's all over the place. The leadership is gone um, and uh, it's like a new chairman every day. And also just the fact that the media over here is kind of always trying to trigger some new controversy. It's like a really, really toxic environment to be in. And from the PCB's perspective, if you're willing to drop $2 million, I've had conversations with people who said that they could have potentially convinced Andy Flower if they were brought into the loop because there are some existing relationships via the franchise circuit. Mm. So go for someone with badges then. If you want to pay $2 million, go for someone who has a specialized, you know, uh, certification in cricket coaching because well, not, a job. Not even that. Like, I mean, if you if that's how much money they were willing to spend and, and that is the kind of money we're looking at now. Like, you know, we know what Brendan McCullum, the sort of mm. the base, in the, you know, roughly what he's on and, mm. um, you know, we know the sort of money that some of these other teams are looking to spend. If that is the case, then I think you're right. What you have to do is go, okay, so who are the best five coaches in the world? That's not exactly. what they did, right? They What they did was they wanted Watto. They, they got their mind fixated on him. I'm not saying he's a bad coach at all. I, I don't yeah. know what he's going to be like as a coach. But He's a young coach. Yeah. I, I, I've said this before. When he commentated on that same World Cup as Dale Stane, I was like, I cannot wait to hear Dale Stane. I can't believe Shane Watson's commentating. And five minutes in, I was like, oh, I got this wrong. Dale Stane's fine, but, you know, uh, I think, I've said this before, Dale Stane would be great on a podcast, but on commentary, it doesn't quite work as well. Watto just absolutely nailed it. And I was sitting there going, there's just insight after insight here. So, so I, I, and, you know, you hope that translates to being a coach as well. Sometimes I think coaches are hired on how they commentate and it is two different skills, but that's a different question for another day. But what I, what I would say is, if you're going to spend that much money, you want to make sure that you are getting Brendan McCullum, right? Or, you yeah. know, or Andy Flower or Mickey Arthur or, you know, these coaches with incredible record, Ravi Shastri or whoever it may be, you know, coaches with really good records and, and everything else. If you're not doing that, then w w what are you doing here, right? Yeah. And also there's a, there's a, there is a bit of a thing of like, you know, you, you've asked someone out on a date, um, and they're like they're willing to go to McDonald's, and you've now taken them to the Ritz, and you try and pick them up in a limousine with with a tuxedo, and they're like, "But I'm dressed for McDonald's." <laughs> yeah, I mean, Watto is still a new coach, and who's to say how good he is? But just look at the fact that you know you had Mike Hessen coaching one of the franchises. Maybe spend that money on him. He probably would decline because he has franchise gigs all over as well. And Andy Flower is someone who has worked with Pakistan cricket prior. Grant Flower has worked with Pakistan a lot. All the flowers. Years. Yeah, yeah, they have that connection and, and they like working over here. So maybe go for them. And also, you know, you talked about leaked conversations and all of that. This entire bargaining ordeal between Watto and the PCB was leaked. We know about all of these things. We know the numbers. So maybe that was a red flag big enough for Watto to say that's, no. I mean, that's what I was saying before. It's that sort of stuff of like, you know, it, coaching an international cricket team is just hard. It's, you're under pressure. It's... Uh, I, especially now with the multi-formats, it, it is such a tough job. The fact that you can make more money sometimes or the same money in franchise cricket, which is a much easier job, is obviously going to stretch things out. But there are still some people who haven't gone into the franchise setup. Like Someone like Chris, Chris Silver would probably have thought to himself, well, I've been offered this job with Sri Lanka um, and I can take that straight away and I, and I can move over there. But if I go to the franchises, I kind of have to find my way and build my way back up. So there are going to be people who go the national route and there are going to be people who go the franchise route. We understand all that, but it is a tough job. If you, While you're negotiating, all the details are out in the public. And maybe, as you said before, maybe someone like Sean Tate, Matthew Hayden, yeah, perhaps as well. You know, um, uh, Jeff Lawson. Or, you know, there are many people he could have talked to who would just be like, it's not worth it, yeah. right? And and that's that's the issue, I think, that bothers me is that, a lot of these guys are not taking these positions because they do not think the professionalism is there and that the job is worth it. Coaching Pakistan should be the third or fourth most important job in cricket, yeah. right? And it's not, and it's never been, and it's a bit of a joke, 
right? And we know that. And, you know, and, and, and that is a real, real shame. And that's about the professionalism of some of these teams. And yeah. it, I promise you, some of this stuff happens at franchise level. I've been at the Pakistani equivalent of a CPL team. I know what it's like to be involved with bad, you know, uh, management. Um, so I'm aware of that it can happen in franchise cricket too. But in franchise cricket, you just don't have the same level of scrutiny. So you, you can just be like, oh, well, if the owner wants to do this, if yeah. the owner wants to make his nephew a... Um, uh, vice captain of the team and i'm still getting paid my contract and okay that's fine you know maybe i'll do that but yeah that's um the whole thing's quite full on yeah uh vedan kashyap has asked over here in a question that why can't pakistan trust pakistani domestic coach as well because uh every time there's a change in chairman uh some guy says domestic coaches then the next one says foreign then it's domestic then it's foreign they have yeah. these fixated fixated obsessions and i mentioned earlier in this same podcast that they have a special kind of hard on for aussies because the australians beat them in big tournaments every now and then so they just feel like australia has something that pakistan doesn't and you know that's why they're always keen to bring them on board and what was just a prime example exactly i've said this before if you're starting the conversation with we need a foreign coach or we need a domestic coach, the conversation's already wrong. Yeah. The conversation has to start with what kind of coach do we need? Mm. Who are the best coaches that fit that template? That, that profile, right? yeah. So, so, you know, I've done some work from franchise cricket where my job has been to find a coach. And they always say, tell us who the best five coaches are. And I said, that's absolutely pointless. Right? Yeah. What? kind of coach do we need for this franchise is the first question you need to ask right now where is the team at what do they need let's work back from that and if you're starting with we need a domestic coach we need a foreign coach we, it's, that's that's just idiocy 101 i don't know why that's a university course but now it is yeah. Anyway, uh, in other news, of course, uh, coaching is a hot topic. And Sri Lanka have hired a new fast bowling coach. Akib Javed, the head coach of the Lahore Kalandas, is going to be coaching them during the T20 World Cup in the USA and the Caribbean. So Akib is someone who is a bit of a character. Uh, he is either loved or hated by the people who he interacts with. And uh, he's been Lahore Kalandas coach for nine seasons played three finals, won two of them, and then there's six years in which they did not progress to the playoffs. So they were garbage. Mm. And uh, he does have some good, uh, you know, uh, honours back in the day. Under-19 World Cup in 2004, he won with Pakistan. T20 World Cup 2009, he was the fast bowling coach back then. He was coach of the UAE as well when they got ODI status and uh, qualified for the 2015 World Cup. Of course, he himself is a 1992 World Cup winner. So it's not like Akib does not have a resume. He does. And maybe, you know, with Sri Lanka having so many raw fast bowling talents, I know Madhushanka is injured right now, but he's around. Lahiru Kumara is still pretty good. And uh, you've got a couple of slingers in Pathirana and Tushara. So he's worked with a slinger in Zaman Khan as well. So maybe Akip isn't the worst pick because that ego element won't come in Sri Lanka. It probably is more so apparent in Pakistan because of the way things are over here. Maybe he's well behaved in Sri Lanka. So I know you guys might be surprised, but I think it, there is a small chance that it, this works out well. Small chance that in four months he'll be looking for a new job. Yeah. Even if it works I mean, out well. He's just been hired for the World Cup, right? So yeah. Estelle was really keen to hear my thoughts and our thoughts on this. So I, no, I thought Estelle, it was interesting, yeah. Yeah, it's a flip of a coin sort of situation because it's not like he hasn't worked with international teams before. He's been successful with them as well. The UAE is probably uh, the one that stands out over here. And, uh, you know, sure, he's had some success with Pakistan teams, mm. but I feel like the UAE one is the job that we really need to focus in over here or focus on over here uh, because that's the one in which he was in an environment where he wasn't running around like a king. When you coach UAE, you have to be like a school coach because there are a lot of guys who just, their raw talent isn't a problem, you know, but there are a lot of guys who haven't gone through systems. So they need to be taught very basic things. He's going to be working with different kinds of cricketers. So now I think there's a couple of young Sri Lankan players who are probably going to be in that raw kind of um, thing that he's going to have to work with. So it's interesting. Yeah, and it's just a World Cup. So Sri Lanka probably don't have a lot of hope spinned on doing like winning this world cup at least so if they or some of their seamers have a good tournament then this will be a, a minor win for them i believe anyway ashish or oh, sorry anish with the 10,000th super chat of the day uh, thanks for all the money anish we we love you 
He says, which international team would you guys like to coach? Obviously, India. I want to get paid. <laughs> I wonder if what Raul Dravid is on compared to Brendan McCullum or compared to what Shane Watson was just offered, by the way. Um, what? Uh, hmm, that's a really interesting question. New Zealand? Yeah, it's safe. They'll stick around with us for a long time. Actually, maybe, yeah, maybe someone like Ireland, New Zealand. I'm trying to think of someone else that's sort of coming through. Um, I mean, we'll get to spend a lot of time in New Zealand. That's a plus, right? Yeah, like I think it, I'd like to work with a cricket board that is willing to try some things hmm. without their, their, their fear of in three months' time, they're going to rip the whole thing up and we we'll start again. I, and I think those two cricket boards come, come to my mind that would be maybe slightly more open to those sorts of things. Um, but I'm not about to become a cricket coach. And if I were to be offered some sort of role, it would probably be like team manager at best. I can't coach for shit. Uh, so I would like to have some structure. So actually on second thought, New Zealand would be the best place to go because they're all nice people. We'll hang out, have a fun time. And I just, there's be, there's no full-time cricket involved. riders, right? Like <laughs> you can do the shit job and you still probably see out your contract after two years. Yeah, yeah you know, maybe um, maybe Mark Richardson slags you off on the radio occasionally and you're just like, okay. I could take that. That just seems like the the cruisiest job. But also, I do think they did some incredible things with the way they changed how their cricket was played. Um, mm. And they seem more open to changes. And the other place, as I said, Cricket Island is a really interesting one. Um, they don't have the money. Not that New Zealand have a lot, but Cricket Island didn't have any. But again, you are starting with almost a blank slate at times. So they're probably, some, they, you know, you could go in and have some really good chats with people. But this is why we are doing this, because we want to get this team to this section. Right. And, and you can't do that. If you did that in Australia, you'd be like, mate, this is how we play cricket. Piss off. Yeah. Also, you want to be in New Zealand because cricket won't be the be all and end all. Hey, so we lost at least. That's what I mean. It's not, it's cricket. just not the same, is it? Like it's yeah. the, you know, from that p point of view, it's, a, you know, it's the, it's the cruisiest, um, it's the cruisiest uh, cricket coaching job, I would have thought. Not to act, not the actual coaching, but the outside of coaching. <laughs> All right, final topic of the day on this episode of Uncovered. We've been going on for quite a while, and uh, I think it's it, w it would not have been fair had we not talked about this. RCB, after being a franchise T20 organization for, what, 16 years now? When was the first IPL? Yeah, 2008. 16, years. Yeah, 16 years, that's correct. Uh, they finally won a title, and the women have brought that to them. Uh, Elise Perry did really well. Smriti led them. They've got Richard Ghosh in that team. Uh, the streets were flooded. RCB fans were losing this shit online. It was actually quite wholesome to watch. I'm happy for mm. RCB. But it's been a long time coming, so much so that Vijay Malia has tweeted, Jared. Vijay Malia. One day I will release all my Vijay Malia stories. But um, yes, it is. Um, look, I just, I think we talked about it in the in the last podcast, but, you know, we, we it, it's a really important thing. I think it couldn't happen to a better side slash fan base not that i wished any good on rcb because obviously i was involved with them briefly and you know like not that i have ill will but i wasn't you know massively excited about working for all of them but if there's any fan base that was going to celebrate this the right way it was this fan base you know i'm not saying some of the other fan bases haven't had some shit sandwiches as well but there's something special about the rcb shit sandwich considering the sorts of players that they've had and everything else yeah and i just felt like the fan base earned this and and as you said they have acted that way right it's been a, it's been a joyous time and uh, again it just shows us how much women's cricket has, has grown um, and Elise Perry like what a ridiculous player she is because a couple of years ago I mean I don't know if hypercourse is in the con uh, comments but a couple of years ago she wasn't really a fantastic T20 player anymore and, and now she's taking six furs <laughs> and then, like, I saw the game where she took the six for, and I was just like, what the fuck is going on here? Um, and and her batting has got more T20 focused as well. I, she's just, you know, an incredible player. But, yeah, I think, for me, it's more about the uh, – it's about the women's cricket, and it shows you just how much it's growing. But then it's also about the RCB fan base, who is a genuine fan base, right? Like, I felt, as someone who covered this from the start, they were one of the first teams that had, like, a genuine – fan base that acted like fan. I, I remember being shocked back at the start of how quickly RCB fans just seemed to come around that team and what did they get for that absolutely nothing so to get this title um I think has given them something and I don't think the men are about to win one 
So, yeah. um, uh, you know, it might it might be another mega auction um, coming up where the men will need something to come back. So, uh, you know, huge for them and well done to all those people who have given a shit for 16 years. Yeah, yeah. You guys have definitely, you know, deserved this win. And uh, I suppose that Smithy, Pez, Richard, Kate Cross, they've done what Kohli, De Villiers, Gale, someone else I'm missing. Have not oh my God, been. I'm definitely going to get Kate Cross on a podcast to say, so uh, do you think you're better than Chris Gale? <laughs> <laughs> definitely. All right. Last Super Chat of the day, guys. I have to actually jump right off. Uh, we all have to jump. Yeah, yeah, because I also have to eat before my fast starts. So oh, yeah. It's complicated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, UM123 has given us a team and he's asked me what I think of this team. So, Sayam Babar, Rizwan, Harish, Shadab, Ifti, Imad, Amir Jamal, Shaheen, Naseem, Zaman Khan. Um, I like how you've gone with Sayam and Babar up top because we've seen that it's a successful opening pair in the PSL. Also, Sayam is belligerent. He's attacking and... He can complement Barber 3.0 well because Barber 3.0 is consistently going at 140 to 150 in the power play, which is promising. So in your batting order, if Barber gets out, I would send Rizwan because you'd always kind of need one of those mm -hmm. guys to be on the crease. And if Sime gets out, I'll send Harris. If Barber plays wrong, uh, not wrong, long, I would never send Rizwan. I would automatically move forward to Shadab and Ifti and the likes who can dominate, you know, uh, spin. Uh, well, Shadab can dominate spin, not Ifti. And then they can kind of hit out towards the end. Imad is still retired from international cricket, but he had a splendid PSL. So if he can come back, that could solve a lot of issues with respect to batting still, and bowling. Depth. It's still three spinners who can't take a wicket though, isn't it? Yeah. So I would actually not have Amir Jamal in there. I would probably go for Abrar or Osama Mir. I'm actually more keen on Abrar Ahmed because I feel like even though Osama Mir got more wickets or the most wickets for any bowler in the PSL, Abrar was bowling in the power play. The quality of his wickets was, be was better. And he has a mystery spin element to him. So also, Asam Amir in the final looked like he, again, and it's not the only time we've seen him in, in high leverage games, just not look like he's ready yeah, yet. That's my thing with Osama Amir. Like, sometimes it's like I'm happy and sad when he does well because I'm like, oh, Pakistan has screwed for another ICC tournament, but then he's doing well. And it's the angle that he bowls at, which probably helps him a lot. And he's been varying his pace and whatnot. And he's working with Alex Hartley, who he has credited as well. But yeah, uh, I definitely have another spinner in there who I can, who I at least feel can get me wickets. And Abrar is someone I'm tilting towards ahead of Osama. But Osama's probably going to play because he took all those wickets. Uh, if Harris Rauf is available, I'd still take him. I know a lot of people hate him, but hey, express pace, who doesn't like that? Apparently, Pakistan's new chairman. Hmm. Yeah, definitely not. And I mean, with the with the dislocated shoulder and everything, mm. it is a big uh, worry. But hey, Zaman Khan, Slinger, does well in the death, whatever. Sure, Pakistan, if they just come together, they'll be tough to beat at the World Cup. If they don't, group stage exit. Ireland are knocking them out. Yeah, yeah for sure. Anyway, that brings us uh, to a close. Uh, thank you, everyone in the comment section who stayed on for both overthrows and uncovered. That'll be it for this week. We'll be back with another episode of Uncovered next week. You were with Bar uh, Barrett and Jehram. That's who, that's who you were with. Uh, and yeah, we'll see you next week. Goodbye. Occasionally, I also talk about behind the scenes stuff. A huge thanks to everyone who has supported us on Patreon and helped us build this channel. Join our Patreon community and unlock exclusive benefits. Enjoy AMAs, live calls with me, and connect with fellow cricket enthusiasts on Discord. Express your cricket fandom with Bodyline t-shirts. Discover their extensive range of player-inspired tees, featuring cricket legends such as Murali, Warn, and Wazim. With team-themed designs and options for hardcore cricket nerds, they've got you covered no matter what your interest in cricket is.